Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Medical Board of California quarterly board meeting. While this meeting is being conducted with all participating board members and staff at the Sacramento meeting location, this meeting is being streamed interactively using WebEx to allow for remote public comment in the same manner as recent meetings. Public comments will be heard for each agenda item for individuals wishing to do so in person and remotely. To be ready for remote public comment, we ask that you please ensure your comments can be heard clearly by connecting to the audio of the meeting through the proper method. If you are having difficulty hearing the audio of this meeting, it could be because the device you're connecting with has bandwidth limitations. If you do have difficulty hearing the audio of this meeting using your device, please click the ellipsis button at the bottom of the WebEx application or the audio and video menu option at the top of the WebEx application and then select switch audio. You will see an option to call in and will be provided with a telephone number, access code, and attendee ID that can be used to connect to the meeting audio via phone. Using the information provided, it will automatically disconnect your device's audio and connect your phone to the name you joined the meeting with. By using this method, if you are having audio problems with your device, this will allow you to still participate and hear the audio of the board meeting. Please see the instructions on how to connect link on the meeting agenda for step-by-step -step WebEx <coughs> instructions, including screenshots. Thank you, President Lawson. You may now start the meeting. Thank you, Sean, and good afternoon, board members and members of the public. Welcome back to in-person meetings for the first time since 2020. Uh, since we are here in person, I'm going to ask the board members to please double check both your laptops and any other electronic devices that you have at the dais, just to make sure they're on uh, silent so there's no interference. Uh, for members of the public, you may notice that board members are accessing their laptops, their phones, or other devices during the meeting. They are using these devices to access board meeting materials that are in electronic format. If you are a member of the media and require assistance or information, please do see the board's public information manager, Carlos Fiatoro, uh, who's sitting right up here at the front. We will have a designated time on the agenda for public comment, and we will ask for public comment on each agenda item. This is an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California, and as such, disruptions of the board's business will not be tolerated. Government Code Section 11126.5 allows the board to remove people who willfully interrupt a meeting and to clear the room or virtual space if order cannot be restored by removing or muting the disruptive people. The board welcomes public comments on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comments prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please do raise your hand or come forward and you will be recognized. I would like to request all speakers to please fill out a speaker slip so that I can call you by name at the appropriate time and also so that the record of the meeting can be full and complete. However, this is voluntary. Please give the speaker slips to Ms. Chu, uh, who's seated right over here. Uh, Ms. Chu, if you just identify yourself for the audience. I will do my best to call on everyone who has applied a slip for the agenda item and recognize those who wish to make a last minute comment. As Sean mentioned, this meeting is also being streamed via WebEx. Individuals attending the meeting remotely via WebEx will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by the host who will be facilitating the WebEx meeting. During each agenda item, the host moderating this WebEx event will activate the hand raising and Q&A features of WebEx and we'll ask anyone wishing to make a public comment to indicate so by raising their hand or entering yes in the Q&A window. The host will then call on individuals who indicated they wish to make public comments by the name provided by the individual, which may be a pseudonym. When called upon, the host will unmute the microphone of the individual and they will have three minutes to make their public comment. The host will audibly announce when 30 seconds remain to conclude the public comment. And after three minutes have lapsed, the individual will be placed back on mute. Only one public comment per agenda item will be allowed per attendee. Uh, as Sean also mentioned, please do see page four of the agenda for WebEx instructions on how to connect from the link on the agenda and additional helpful instructions. During agenda item two, public comments on items not on the agenda, the board has limited the total public comment period for individuals to 40 minutes. Therefore, after 40 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any other agenda item, 20 minutes will be allowed for the comment period. And then after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Each person will be limited to a maximum of three minutes per agenda item, but this time period may be reduced depending on the number of people who wish to speak. I'd like to remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comments to the allotted time or less. Today's meeting will be run in accordance with the Open Meeting Act as required by law. We plan to end today's meeting by 6.30 p.m. 
I would now like to formally call the meeting to order at 2.05 p.m. And Ms. Uh, Moriarty, please call the roll. Mr. Brooks? Here. Dr. Gonadev? Here. Dr. Hawkins? Here. Dr. Hilzer? Here. Ms. Jiang? Ms. Lubiano? Dr. Mahmoud? Mr. Rayu? Here. Dr. Thorpe? Here. Dr. Sai? Here. Mr. Watkins? Yeah. Dr. Yip? Ms. Lawson? Here. Thank you, a quorum is present. Uh, I would like to remind members again that we will be taking a roll call vote on all action items. We will now move on to agenda item two, public comments on items not on the agenda. And before I ask for public comments, I would ask individuals making comments to please not discuss pending complaints, pending license applications, or pending disciplinary actions that may come before the board for a decision. Such discussions are considered ex parte communications as they could provide information to the members that is outside of the record in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. Therefore, such discussions could create a conflict and lead to a board decision being challenged in Superior Court. The board can receive comments regarding the board's processes in general, but it cannot receive comments on specific case circumstances where a decision is still pending. In addition, the board requests the public to address the board as a whole and not individual members. And please be aware that public comment during this agenda item should provide information to the board members and is not a discussion between the board members and the public. The only action board members can take is to listen to the comments and decide whether they want a future agenda item on the topic. No other action can be taken at this meeting. Though it may seem at times like the board members are not being responsive, following these guidelines is critical to ensure the rules of the Open Meeting Act are followed and to avoid compromising both the speaker's goals and the board's mission. If you'd like to comment on an agenda item, please do wait till we get to that agenda item. Comments at this time are only for items not on the agenda. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. First, are there any comments from members of the public in the hearing room? All right, seeing none, I will now ask for the host to please call for public comments on WebEx. Sean? Thank you, President Lawson. Anyone wish to make a public comment, please use the hand raising function or type uh, anything into the Q&A box and we'll call on you in the order received. Uh, first up here, I have Susan Lauren. Susan, give me a line, moment to open your line. Hey, Susan, you should be seeing that request on your end. Um, hello, good afternoon. We can hear you, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, the new members will see a lot of plastic surgery cases come before them. Many of the doctors are arrogant, even sadistic, misogynistic surgeons and they're protected and empowered by their lobbies, insurance companies, unscrupulous lawyers, and the medical board. Medical board experts are supposed to be objective, reasoned, and impartial. Terry Dubrow, a plastic surgery expert for this board, is banned until 2028 by the military health agency for repeated abuse. He was corrupt and lied profusely in my civil case of disabling battery. The jury said they went with Dubrow because of the authority conferred upon him by the medical board. Every case Dubrow works on should be judicially challenged. And for the life of me, I don't know why you still contract with him. In my opinion, the medical board failed the public by contracting Dubrow as an expert in the first place. He was on the exploitive TV shows, Extreme Makeover, Bridal Plasty, and the swan that helped popularize harmful, risky plastic surgery worldwide. A reputable medical board would not license doctors to do scams and exploit people and use duplicitous doctors as experts. Saul Berger, who I initiated breast reduction with, battered me. I was fit and athletic with some skin ptosis, not a candidate for liposuction, which is a scam anyway. Every ethical doctor who examined me is horrified by what, by what Berger did. Against need, consent, or rationale, Berger stabbed me dozens of times into my hip bones, IT bands, hamstrings, kneecaps, breasts, and butt, removing needed tissue and telling everyone I had factitious disorder after he left me mutilated and bloodied. It wasn't a mistake. I didn't ask for it. 
There are no mitigating circumstances. It's assault. Salberger isn't fit to practice, period. The medical board was not neutral or informed in my case of clear and convincing surgical battery. The California medical Liposuction code is dangerous. Lowering the volume of tissue removed is not a solution for this racket. I ask California to be the maverick in prevention regarding plastic and cosmetic surgery. Doctors ignore biology, layer on procedures to admit that. Okay, can, um, they omit and lie. Lie and omit the truth, and if a massage therapist harmed or killed someone, they'd be stopped for good. Even the deadly Ford Pinto was recalled, but you treat plastic surgery procedures as gold. It's all about the money. Now, I'm asking you this, and I've asked for 10 years to you and legislators. Change the liposuction code. Remove Terry Dubrow as a medical board expert and let the public know why. Do not allow medical board experts to testify against victims in civil court because juries are biased by this. Prosecute surgical assault as a criminal act. Make it standard for consumers to contribute to their Clear. medical records, contribute and emerge, create an emergency number for people being harmed by doctors. Thank you. And watch the verdict by Paul Newman. It, it really says everything. It's a great movie too. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up here we have Marion Hollingsworth. Marion, give me just a second. You should be seeing that prompt on your end. We can, please go ahead. Okay. okay, great, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Marion Hollingsworth and I'm a patient safety advocate. Some of you may have read the critical investigative stories the LA Times wrote about this medical board. What you may not know is that this series of articles won a top investigative journalism award this week. They give these awards for journalistic excellence, especially when it affects change. Some of you may have noticed that the Times reporting led to at least two bills being introduced, bills that would not have been needed if this board had actually made patient safety a priority. And some of you may not know where the Times got some of this information in the first place. We advocates have been asking, even begging this board to protect us from dangerous doctors, and you repeatedly dismissed us. You refused to listen to us, but the Times listened and acted. I witnessed the panel where Zachary Cosgrove claimed he deserved to have his license reinstated after egregious sexual misconduct because, quote, he had found God and needed the license here first to practice in Texas. Well, Texas refer refused to license him, but you did. You listened to him and gave his license back. Mark Zweifak admitted at his panel that he had relapsed since his surrender for his child pornography addiction, yet you gave him his license back. You listened to his pleas for mercy. I could go along with cases where the board failed to protect the public, but the bottom line is you haven't listened to us. Why did you wait to be embarrassed by the times to suddenly want to promote patient safety? If you had listened to advocates and harm patients in the first place, you could have saved this board a lot of embarrassment. If you had listened to me, another patient would not have been overdosed by the doctor who harmed my father. Board President Lawson reportedly sent the times an email saying that the articles quote, made us better. Why did the negative press suddenly make you want to do better? It's like saying sorry for a crime after being caught. You knew what you were doing. Why couldn't you have done better on your own? C.S. Lewis wrote, uh, wrote the famous quote that integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. Well, maybe you should adopt that attitude. The thing is, we don't have to make wild accusations against this board. Your actions speak quite clearly. I told one reporter that I could back up everything I said with a document or video. Every case had concrete evidence of how you failed a patient in order to protect a doctor and keep them in practice. So here's your chance. Half of this board is new or relatively new. I ask you to find that integrity you feel you so richly deserve and prove that you can act in the public interest, whether you are being watched or not. And while you're at it, please start listening to complainants and advocates. 30 seconds removed. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. I'm um, trying to get the full screen video back up, so please bear with me on that. I'm Working on that here as we go. Um, let's see. The next hand up here we had was from Dr. Hannah Ree. Dr. Hannah Ree, you should be seeing the prompt on your end. Thank you. Uh, this is Hannah Ree with Black Patients Matter. 
And I thank you for the opportunity again to uh, speak with you all. So a very serious and important um, topic I wanted to bring up, and I, I know we've mentioned this before, that of corruption. And so certainly, um, as we all know, each individual present here uh, has a specific job description and um, a limited um, allotment of uh, decisions that they can make or, or uh, duties that they can perform. And so it would take someone such as myself to tell you the corruption that goes on. So first and foremost is that the OAH. So for whatever reason, um, there is an individual, some party that is altering the transcripts of the hearing so much so that it is not being signed and certified by the um, court reporter. And secondly, you may or may not know that it takes a minimum of four, four California AGs, uh, deputy AGs to uh, take a case to hearing. And so that is an unnecessary amount of um, AGs to take to hearing because the hearings office has never found a physician innocent of the charges. So we're talking about a system that is corrupt and expensive. Not only that, it only prosecutes less than 1% of the complaints and not even the most serious. So therefore, how do we fix it? I'm here to tell you that again, we have filed another federal civil rights lawsuit um, and it is against several parties, one being that of Ms. Lawson and others involved because the corruption of the funds to prosecute the cases are being mishandled and those that are held accountable are not even sitting in front of us because those that are sitting in front of us have a limited job description. It is those working behind the scenes that are misusing the funds um, in prosecuting the cases. So therefore we need to somehow be able to address the corruption. I believe we are doing so. 30 seconds remain. Um, we're we're uh, scratching away at it, but it's going to take big lawsuits uh, to address it. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up here we have Brianna Peel, I believe. Brianna, you should be seeing a request on your end. I'm. Um, I ask that you guys reevaluate how you guys handle cases. I filed a complaint in 2018 and had it closed just recently, February 2022. I never received a formal notice of the doctor's punishment, which I think is very irresponsible. And um, you know, I think that that needs to be handled. Um, it shouldn't take four years to get a response when a patient loses their life, the patient being my father. I also think that um, that we need to thirty thousand. Dr. Yang has had three lawsuits against him from twenty seventeen through twenty twenty. Two of the lawsuits have had medical board complaints, which has resulted in his public reprimand. The third one has yet to be reported on the website, and the lawsuit settled for well over 30,000. So I'm just asking that we find a way to make um, these public complaints, you know, get through the system faster, because I think four years for a doctor who continues to be able to practice. Um, when they've shown to be negligent and their behavior is not fair to the public or public safety. That's thank you for your, oh, thank you very much for your public comment. Uh, up next here, we have Christina Ogden. Christina, you should be getting that, Kristen Ogden, I'm sorry, you should be receiving that prompt on your end.
Kristen? Can you, can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kristen Ogden. I am an advocate for intractable pain patients. At the last meeting, I recall some discussion near the end of the meeting about difficulties patients were having getting their prescriptions filled. And I believe the board went on to approve a suggestion that the medical board reach out to the board of pharmacy and engage in some discussions to try to learn more about what uh, is causing patients to have such problems. This is a matter that is of great concern to me. And I believe there are a number of issues and barriers that have a great impact on intractable pain patients, and it's growing worse as time passes. A part of it may be attributable to the fact that DEA has drastically cut production quotas for many controlled medications, but there are also locally specific policies that really create barriers for patients. I have some knowledge and experience of filling prescriptions in LA County, for example, and in that area, it seems that every pharmacy, at least the independent pharmacies, they have a different set of rules and restrictions that are put forth by apparently um, oversight boards comprised of distributor representatives. I've recently heard that also DEA representatives are involved in these boards or oversight committees. And what the, the outcome seems to be from my phone calls and efforts to locate pharmacies who could fill medications for my husband is that the rules vary from pharmacy to pharmacy. There doesn't seem to be anything consistent or clear. And it really does make for a confusing situation. In regard to the reduction of the production quotas and the supply, unfortunately, as we have said on a number of occasions, severe intractable pain patients often require higher doses than most patients, sometimes unusually high doses. But patients are finding that any specific pharmacy probably cannot meet their needs because they don't have adequate supply to do so. And so patients who had previously done very well on a particular oral medicine, for example, have been put in a situation away. where their doctor has to prescribe other kinds of medications uh, to try to make up the difference for the lack of availability. I will conclude by saying that this is a matter of great concern and great importance, and I'm glad the board is interested in it. But I wonder if board members of the medical board or pharmacy board really know a lot, a lot about what it's like out in the field. What's it really like for patients and their families? And I would recommend that you include patients and advocates should there be appropriate discussion opportunities. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, up next, we have Anne Fuquay. And you should be receiving that. There we go. Anne, are you there? Can you hear me? There you go. Okay, yes. excellent. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anne Fuquay. I'm on the community board for the National Pain Advocacy Center and a member of Families for Intractable Pain Relief. Um, first, I want to express my gratitude for last quarter's discussion about pain. And as Ms. Ogden stated, we were very appreciative that the board stated it would contact the pharmacy board regarding the serious difficulty that patients are incurring when they attempt to fill their medication. The impact that this has on patients' lives can be devastating. Not yet de devastating. It's not just about discomfort, pain. Um, there are patients that are experiencing serious high blood pressure as a result of pain, arrhythmias, and um, the um, risk of patient deaths that I have um, maintained for the past years can, can, contains a growing number of patients that have had myocardial infarctions or tubos cardiomyopathy um, due to uncontrolled pain or withdrawal. Uh, there have been an increasing number of these nationally and in California where it has been due to the pharmacy being unable to get the patient's medication. A patient has a script for medication yet they can't get it filled. Um, just this morning, I was informed about a patient who had a heart attack um, 
yesterday evening um, after driving around with her daughter all day attempting to get a medication filled. She's now in the um, ICU and they're uncertain whether or not she will survive. This is, you know, it, it's a life and death deal for people. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, up next here we have Eric Anders. Eric, you should be seeing that prompt on your end. So Eric, it looks like your line is open. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, I've long felt that the Federation of State Medical Boards, AKA FSMB, was just as laughable as this board. And now that I hear that Christina has won an award from them, it cements the fact in my mind. Remember, she's the one who has continuously posted her horrible, threatening account with a so-called ambush online and did all kinds of dramatic news interviews and yet didn't feel it was necessary to even file a police report. This is also the person who, along with Carlos Villatoro, created a video that says that there's a that there is a, a doctor's license can never be permanently revoked. And yet, right from your own guidelines, it states in part, Quote, Business and Professions Code 2417 says a physician and surgeon who practices medicine with a business organization knowing that it is owned or operated in violation of section 1871.4, and then there's three more sections, shall have his or her license to practice permanently revoked. Close quote. Hear that, Christina and Carlos? Your own documents say permanently revoked, but you guys said there's nothing that can permanently revoke a doctor's license. Yet you wonder why the public doesn't trust this medical board. Marion and I have been quite successful using your own words against you in news reports and on the social media. Remember when both Howard Krauss and David Warmuth called to the AG's office for the public to be silenced because they didn't like our brutal honesty? That's against the law and we let the world know it. If you'd like to become one of my, my famous, famous videos, just try and take us on. And yet you all sit there every meeting with these attitudes of disbelief when we speak like you're all better than us and no more than us. Christina tweets things like, quote, any suggestion that the California Medical Board members are being paid to not take disciplinary action when it is warranted is completely false. The accusation is itself harmful misinformation that is damaging to important consumer protection agencies, close quote. That's her new buzzword to try and discredit anyone, and I mean anyone, not just crazies like Dr. Gold, when someone says something that sheds the board in a negative light. Disinformation, that's her new buzzword. It's shameful, and now it's all coming back to haunt you all, and we're not going to stop. We've put in years now holding you accountable, and we're on a roll. So I've said it before, fasten your seatbelts, board members. This is going to be a bumpy ride. Get it, Christina? Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Virginia. Virginia, you should be seeing that prompt on your side. Virginia, I think believe your line's open. Can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Hi, sorry, I have a cold, so I sound horrible. Um, no and it's not COVID, I tested myself. Um, first in the Senate hearing, I found it really concerning when met, they said the lack of concern for um, proper medical records, because we complain every meeting about our false medical records, and then you guys say we don't have enough evidence to do anything. Well, you don't have any enough evidence because you have false medical records. So it's really concerning when the director says that is not one of his concerns because you can't do anything without accurate medical records. As Apple, I said, my Novasure, I couldn't sit for three years after and had 20 injections for pain. So they took off that I even had the Novasure surgery and nothing's listed about it. You don't even know what happened to me for my medical records. Second, it's a little tone deaf when reentry people have more resources than those who have medical errors. So it gets frustrating when new board members, it's just really tone deaf. If I was a criminal, I would have more resources than I do as a patient. I don't know how much 
it's been a re-injury, but it's much more more than patients with medical errors. We don't have access to lawyers to help us. And it'd be helpful if you had a patient safety expert on the board, if you focus on preventative, and also if you use science and research to make the laws that you are working on instead of just opinions. And that is it for now. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, up next here we have Christina Hildebrand. Christina, let me find your line. There we go, Christina, you shouldn't be receiving that prompt on your end. Christina, you there? Yep, can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Just so you're aware, there's a delay between when it unmutes and it actually unmutes, which is why you could don't hear people. Um, uh, Christina Hildebrand, a voice for choice advocacy. Um, I'm, <laughs> it's funny because we sit on the other side, but have the same complaints. So, um, you know, I want our organization educates and advocates for informed choice and transparency of what goes into your body. One of them, uh, you know, one of those things is vaccines. Um, we are finding that a doctors will not write there is there are not doctors in California that will write medical exemptions anymore because of the law that was passed in 2015 and then 2019. Um, even if a child has had, uh, you know, has been paralyzed and has won money in the vaccine compensation program, um, the only medical exemptions that seem to be being, being accepted are uh, medical exemptions that are for oncology patients, which are temporary or um, if a child has titers for, for measles, mumps, and rubella. And, you know, as the medical board, you're supposed to watch out for consumers. And you're not doing that on this front because you've witch hunted basically every doctor that was willing to write a medical exemption between 2016 and 2019. And, you know, while some of those, you know, it, there's a, there's a, the issue is what the description of standard of care is and doctors were being held to standard of care, whereas they were using, uh, you know, new research. And, and, you know, it's like saying, okay, for cancer, the standard of care is, is uh, radiation, chemotherapy, or surgery. But if you go to the medical clinic, Mayo Clinic, and you use genetic therapies, that those aren't okay to use in California. And so, you know, I asked the medical board to, I get that you're happy that doctors aren't writing medical exemptions, but there are children that need medical exemptions. Every, every drug, every medication has side effects, and there are certain people that can't take them. And I get vaccines are in this world of their own. And when you say vaccines, everyone, you know, jumps for joy. But there are people, and we've seen it with the COVID vaccine especially, there are people that get harmed by these vaccines and that they need medical exemptions and they're not able to get them. And as the consumer, you know, board that's supposed to be watching out for consumers, you're not doing anything for these people. Um, you know, I think we need to, and I bring this up every time I come to a medical board meeting, I haven't been able to make the last couple, but um, we need to work out what the definition of standard of care is. For me. And, and what happens to doctors who are using new technologies and new treatments and outside of the box and off-label treatments and not be witch hunting them? And, you know, again, it amazes me that doctors who write medical exemptions can get their, have been disciplined within six months. But there are people on these calls that who have been waiting years and years to have their doctors disciplined or brought before the board. You need to do things that are not politically minded, but actually look out for consumers. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. This time, President Lawson, I don't see any additional questions with you. Thank you, Sean. I'll bring it, excuse me, bring it back to the board and we will move on to agenda item three, which is approval of the minutes from the February 10th to 11th quarterly board meeting. Uh, just a couple comments. We noticed that there were some formatting issues, uh, just a couple pages where there were uh, some missing information and then an extra page inserted into the document. So those will of course be um, addressed uh, as part of the minutes, but are there any comments uh, or additions or, excuse me, additions or corrections to the February board meeting minutes from the members? Yes, I had some uh, edits and I passed it on just because it's a bit lengthy. 
And so I had five comments on page 10. I have comments on page 11, page 27, page 30, and page 31. And I've written it out, so I'll just submit it to the... That's great. Just for the, Mr. Watkins, for the benefit of the public, would you mind just characterizing the, the nature of those comments? Are they so in corrections? Or? Agenda item T, it was a communication that I had with Ms. Castro, and my response was, um, let me just put up that, mm -hmm. I was using this new page three. On page 10, it starts with Mr. Watson. Currently, it's, it says Mr. Watson asked Ms. Castro how to fix the percentage of deviation of the board guidelines and specifically the probation period. I edited that to, uh, to say Mr. Watson asked Ms. Castro if she had any guidelines for us as a board to bring us closer to following the disciplinary guidelines. And then on page 11, the last paragraph on page 10 leading into 11 in the new document, Mr. Watkins followed. And so I'm just going to read there that Mr. Watkins followed up letting Ms. Castro know that know the presentation made by Ms. Webb on the standard of care is what would happen in a perfect world. But the reality is that is not the way the board operates in any way, shape, or form. And the number of public reprimands speak to that trend and trend toward, trend toward benefiting doctors. Mr. Watkins offered to provide his data and in return that Mr. Castro, Ms. Castro put out the AIDS, AIDS, the Office of the Attorney General's numbers, highlighting the primary reason given for those public reprimands. Mr. Watkins indicated the number of public reprimands is too high and it does not serve the public. Mr. Watkins articulated this question was an attempt to find common ground, which we did not find, and that the things will probably not change. On page 27, I was referred to as a doctor, I'm a mister. On page 30, um, I made an edit that read Mr. Watkins commented that he was the one to propose changes to Section 2330 and offered background on his reasoning for the recommendation. Mr. Watkins requested three things on behalf of the public. First, for the complainant to have a seat at the table in, the due, in due process. The second, equal treatment. And the third is transparency. On page 31, Mr. Watkins, and this is the edit, Mr. Watkins replied that this, this is that this is a fundamental issue. Right now, the board are not legally required to contact the comp complainants after they have given this statement. He suggests giving complainants the vote to bring them onto somewhat of an equal legal footing. And that concludes my edits. Thank you. Any additional uh, additions or corrections from members to the February 11th, 12th, 2022 board meeting minutes? All right, seeing none, may I please have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Second. Uh, Dr. Gananadev with the second, uh, please, and then we'll move on to public comments. Do we have any public comments from members in the meeting room? All right, seeing none, I'll ask Sean to please call for public comments on WebEx. Anyone who would like to make a public comment on agenda number two? Um, please go ahead and raise your hand. I'm sorry, agenda item three. Uh, raise your hand or type anything in that Q&A box and we'll call you an order received. Uh, first up here we have Susan Warren. Susan, let me send you the request. Hello. Um, I looked at, at this and there were several of the of things attributed to what I said that don't have any bearing on what I actually said. And by reading this, you wouldn't know what went on in the meeting. I couldn't do them all because as you know, I'm physically not doing well because of the assault. So I'm going to just tell you about agenda item five. 
And agenda item five, what was written says this. Ms. Susan Lauren agreed with Ms. Lawson regarding the spreading of misinformation and disinformation being a problem. She requested the board reprimand such physicians and asked the board to create legislative updates. Ms. Lauren said she looks forward to the action that the board will take protecting the public. I'm going to read what I actually said. I had to transcribe it last night from the video. Misinformation and disinformation have been going on for decades, as you know, with plastic surgeons and dermatologists and others who are doing scam procedures on people. And I'm asking you to reprimand them and stop them because so much harm can be prevented and we need new thinking and legislative updates around these topics. And this medical board began before these types of practices were even in use. I provided some comprehensive information to the medical board on my suggestions to update the liposuction code. I really want to see action on this. You need to act on this now. I really don't want anyone to say, oh, well, that person went in for liposuction and rolled their eyes. Most of us, like me, go in for another procedure, and if someone does go in just for liposuction, it's because it's minimized and lied about all over. So what are we going to do about this misinformation and disinformation that causes blood baths and all these people to be put in intractable pain, disfigured and disabled? What are we going to do? I mean, really, it's more than time and I'm doing everything that I can to help you. I'm looking for answers. I'm not sure why Terry Dubrow, for example, is your expert. I'm waiting for an answer on that. How is he your expert? And he's going on TV with misinformation about these procedures and he's doing it with the blessing of the medical board. Oh, he's our expert. He uses, he uses that a lot. He uses it in court. He uses it on TV and the military health agency banned him. He lied in my trial, as you know. But why would I stop talking about it when it's also a problem? Anyway, just to wrap this up, since I'm being at the end of my time, in what you wrote, you didn't even mention plastic surgery, the liposuction code, and Terry Dubrow. Come on, what are you hiding? Why are you doing this? I don't have enough energy due to mutilation to correct all of your disinformation. This reminds me of my medical records, and I recommend that all activists might want to look over these minutes because they're so poorly done. Why are you doing this? Why upset us like this? It's, there's no truth in what was written about me. It's, that's, it's just it's mind boggling. Thank you. It's mind boggling. Thank you for your public comment. Up next we have Dr. Hannah Reed. Should we receive that prompt on your end? Yes, thank you. This is uh, uh, Hannah Ree here. So um, I just want all of us, uh, everyone, I guess, who can hear my voice has has witnessed um, the the first example that we have of the corruption. So um, for Ms. Chairperson, Ms. Lawson, herself being an attorney, she would know that it is unjust to vote on approval of the minutes prior to hearing from the public. So I, I wonder what it means for her to call a vote on approval of the public, uh, approval of the minutes prior to hearing from the public comments. I, I, I suppose some may argue it would just mean that uh, the public comments just doesn't matter. Um, and so since she has won an award for the FSMB, I wonder what that says about the FSMB, who are also uh, defendants in our lawsuit. So our public comment is that um, the minutes now no longer state um, the organizations with which we represent. That is a disservice to um, the community and it is unjust. And so certainly there was a problem prior to utilizing the name of our organization, Black Patients Matter. Uh, apparently the word black is not something to be documented in the minutes. So um, I would uh, suggest that we 
um, allow the names of our organizations to be present. And I guess I uh, wonder what it means when the medical board doesn't uh, inform the public that this is an in-person meeting um, that would seem unjust and unfair. I'm assuming that the other um, the other volunteers and advocates were unaware of this being a, a in-person meeting. Thirty seconds remaining. So I I again call call out the corrupt corrupted nature of the medical board, and that um, as this continues, we will continue to point out their disregard for the public. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Eric Anders. Eric, you should be receiving that prompt. Can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead. So who actually takes the minutes and transcribes them into what we see at the meeting? I've asked before and it's never been answered. I've complained countless times about the inaccuracy of the minutes and nothing ever happens to fix it. It seems to be getting worse and worse. There's got to be rules being broken here over the accuracy of these minutes. This is proof that we say things and you just disregard it. Brianna Pele just called in to say that she has not been contacted about the closing of her complaint and her father's death. I wonder how that will end up in the minutes at the next meeting and why no one commented to her to follow up with enforcement. Is, are you no longer caring what victims are telling you that you didn't even bother to follow up with her? Also, why are there so many security guards at the meeting? That's got to be costly. And why are they sitting behind the board? That surely can't, they surely can't move very fast from those positions if they need to be helpful to you all. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. At this time, I do not see additional requests in queue. Thank you, Sean. I'll bring it back to the board. Are there any further additions or corrections to the February 2022 board meeting minutes? All right, seeing none, Ms. Moriarty, if you could please call the roll. Mr. Brooks? Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Hilzer? Yes. Ms. Jiang? Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Mohamed? Mr. Ryu? Yes. Dr. Thorpe? Yes. Dr. Sai? Yes. Mr. Watkins? Aye. Dr. Yip? Ms. Lawson? Yes. Thank you. The February 10th through 11th 22 board meeting minutes are approved. We'll now move on to agenda item four, which is the president's report. Just have a few uh, brief updates. Uh, for all of you, first, I would like to welcome everyone back to our in person meetings after 2 years of virtual meetings. It really is wonderful to be able to see all of you in person. I wanted to extend a special thank you to the board staff and to the DCA staff for all of the hard work that went into making this meeting happen here in person. We do look forward to getting back to our usual routine of meeting at locations across California to ensure the public has the opportunity to attend our meetings in person and engage with uh, the board at meetings that are convenient locations to all of them. Uh, I would next like to take a moment to acknowledge the heroic efforts of one of our licensees. Dr. John Chang was murdered on Sunday when a gunman opened fire at his mother's church in Laguna Woods. According to Orange County officials, Dr. Chang put himself directly in the line of fire to prevent others from being shot. Dr. Chang was a sports medicine physician known for donating his time and expertise to local sports teams. On behalf of the entire Medical Board of California and our staff, we extend our condolences to Dr. Chang's wife and two children and to the greater Orange County community. Gun violence is a major public health problem in our state and in our nation, and we must all work together to ensure the public is safe from harm. As we have talked about previously, the COVID-19 pandemic has unfortunately brought to light how dangerous and deadly misinformation and disinformation can be and how it can negatively impact the health of thousands. Yesterday, we received a communication from one of our licensees on this topic and board members, I encourage you all to read it if you've not yet had the opportunity to do so. This topic is of course of great and urgent interest here in California and across the country. In the coming months, I will have the opportunity to represent the Medical Board of California at two meetings focused on misinformation. 
On June 1st, I will be attending a one-day meeting of the American College of Physicians, American Board of Medical Specialties, Council of Medical Specialty Societies, Federation of State Medical Boards, and the American Board of Internal Medicine focused on misinformation. I will be participating in a panel discussion focused on opportunities we collectively have to address the growing problem of medical misinformation and disinformation. And then in early August, I will be attending the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation Forum on Strategies for the Misinformation Age. I will again be participating in a panel discussion about the role of the medical profession in creating credible sources of information and countering misinformation. I look forward to these opportunities to share information about our experiences here in California and to continue to work to make positive change and ensure the public has access to factual, truthful, evidence-based information. With respect to the board's legislative proposal, since our last meeting, I have had the opportunity to meet with legislators and other stakeholders to discuss our proposals. Uh, as I think you're all aware, I testified in the Assembly Business and Professions Committee on April 19th in support of the board-sponsored bill to change the board's composition to a public member majority. Then on May 6th, I participated in a Senate hearing to discuss a number of the board's enforcement proposals. I'd like to thank Aaron Bone for all of his work to advance the board's legislative agendas and our specific proposals. And lastly, I just want to acknowledge the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and response as we appear to be experiencing an uptick in cases in our communities. I want to thank all frontline professionals, including our licensees and allied health professionals for their work to keep us safe and healthy over the past two years. And I do wanna remind everyone of the significant resources available here in California. You can learn more at uh, covid19.ca.gov. I would now like to take the opportunity to introduce our newest board member who's joined us today, Dr. Veeling Sai, and swear him in as a member of the Medical Board of California. Dr. Sai is an ENT otolaryngologist in Alhambra, California, my apologies, uh, and is affiliated with multiple hospitals in the area, including Alhambra Hospital Medical Center and Garfield Medical Center. He received his medical degree from Southern Illinois University of Medicine and has been in practice for more than 20 years. Dr. Sai, I'd like to invite you to just please come forward here uh, and we can swear you in. Dr. Sai, let me please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, feeling Sai. I, feeling Sai. You solemnly swear that I will support and defend that I will uh, uh, solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the, allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the uh, Constitution of the United States and the State of California. That I will take this, that I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. And I will uh, faithfully, uh, sorry. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties upon, upon the office in which mom which I'm about to enter. Welcome, Dr. Sachs. Thank We're you. really excited to have Thank you on the board. Welcome to the board, and we will have uh, our other newest board member was unable to join us on short notice for this board meeting, but we look forward to having her participation at our next meeting in August. Are there any questions or comments on the president's report from members of the board? All right, Sean, are there any, uh, excuse me, are there any uh, comments from people in the room about the president's report? I have to get used to doing this back with people in person. <laughs> All right, Sean, are there any comments on the WebEx? Yes, if anyone would like to make a public comment, please use the hand raising feature or type something in the Q&A window and we'll call on your order received. Uh, I momentarily saw a call in user there too, so if if you were connected only by phone and wish to make a public comment, you can raise your hand by pressing star three. Uh, first up here, we have Susan Lauren. Send you that request. Hi. Um, 
since this, since the words misinformation and disinformation are being used again in the president's address, I'd like to again say some of what I said last time and please get it correctly in the minutes this time. Um, as you know, with plastic surgeons and dermatologists and others who are doing scan procedures on people, they are giving misinformation and disinformation, and we need this changed. Um, and Ms. Lawson, I sure would love you to take uh, my information to all these places you're going to talk about this misinformation and disinformation. I'm really, um, as you can imagine, uh, I hope you can imagine that I'm confused by what's going on here, by the fact that not just me, but so many people, and especially women, but men too, and everyone's life matters, um, are being harmed and killed by the bad procedures that are not evidence-based, that are not scientifically based, that the science shows is bad. And I just really can't, I'm sure that there's things that I can't even imagine how much money goes into all this and how much protection there are around these procedures and around the doctors that do these procedures. I don't know what more I can do than what I'm doing. I'm asking for help and in, in the minutes meeting, please write that I'm asking why Terry Dubrow is your expert. I've told you um, repeatedly um, some of the things that, that, um, are going on with him and and why are these procedures not being uh why are you not doing anything about this it, people today are going in for liposuctions and things they're going to have long-term harm they're being lied to lied to by their doctors in the media and all over the place um what can i do what will you do i need you to do something this misinformation and disinformation needs to stop. And changing to a public majority, while I support it, it won't change anything when the board remains how it is. And um, I'd like to once again thank Mr. Watkins. That's thank you end. for your prompt comment. Up next, we have Eric Anders. You should be seeing that prompt in your end now. Took a long time to come through, sorry. Um, I remain that you can't complain about misinformation and disinformation when this board is so abhorrently full of misinformation and disinformation. Thank you, Christina, for the list of where you'll be speaking. I'll be sure to send each of those groups proof on how you and the board are full of disinformation. Let's define disinformation. False information, which is intended to mislead especially propaganda used by a government organization to a rival power or the media. Look at the disinformation you portray to the public constantly that this board is actually doing its job and protecting the public from bad doctors. We all know that's a major fabrication or in other words, disinformation by a political agency, namely the Medical Board of California. So stop your talking about disinformation and going on like it's some horrible thing when you guys are guilty of it 100%. It's just two-faced. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Dr. Hannah Reed. Should be receiving that prompt on your side. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, I want to apologize for my previous comment against uh, Ms. Lawson. Apparently, we had not voted yet uh, before the public comments. So for that, I apologize. Uh, but going to the, um, the president's report here, yes, as Mr. Andrews has stated, thank you for letting us know, Ms. Lawson, where you will be so that we can contact those agencies and inform them you are a defendant in an ongoing uh, federal civil rights lawsuit. Um, the problem being that instead of um, pursuing cases, serious cases where, where patients have died, Ms. Lawson has voted to um, revoke the licenses of disabled physicians. So, um, we there's quite a quagmire with that in that um, there is no immunity for those who um, receive federal funds um, and are sued 
uh, in their personal capacity for uh, disability discriminations. And um, I, I believe Ms. Lawson, coming from a long background, has done quite well within that jurisdiction, uh, but in her uh, actions acting uh, in, in the field of medical knowledge, she certainly lacks. And that um, that would probably not carry as much weight speaking to a group of physicians, but um, I guess being the daughter of a, a privileged white uh, individual would serve a purpose. But for minority patients who are underrepresented and are who who uh, who are dying at um, higher rates, it certainly doesn't serve a purpose for us. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Virginia. Should be seeing that prompt on your side momentarily. Hello again. Um, I also have concern about this misinformation, disinformation, because all misinformation, disinformation matters, and we can't just select one aspect of it. The structure of the Medical Act and all the medical laws was based on lobbying, not research, not science. You say you protect patients and you for patient safety, but the whole structure was built from lobbying, not research, not science. So if you want to talk about disinformation, misinformation, you need science and research and safety experts to build your foundation. And therefore, it will be based on research and science and not misinformation and disinformation. And the micro, micro modernization act, there's no science or research. It's based on lobbying. A couple of powerful white men decide what the suffering is for people. That's disinformation and misinformation. And it causes severe harm and severe suffering and suicide and homelessness and PTSD. So please address all misinformation and disinformation and not just selected disinformation or misinformation. Thank you. Your public comment. Next up, we have Christina Hildebrand. Christina, you should be receiving that prompt momentarily. Christina, are you there? Try again here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. I was unmuted, but not me unmuted. Um, uh, Christina Hildebrand, a voice for choice advocacy. I uh, appreciate what the last uh, speaker said. You know, misinformation and disinformation in this day and age is extremely politically fueled. And we need to stop that. You know, you, if you're going to go after misinformation and disinformation, then you need to go at it across the board and not just focus on COVID and, you know, what, what makes sense and what makes good news for today. Um, and so I, I really ask you to do that. I know you've got a bill tomorrow coming up um, that, that I'm sure you're going to vote to support on misinformation and disinformation, but I really hope you listen to the public and and ensure that that goes broader um, and you already have the rights to to discipline doctors for mis for any misinformation and disinformation, but it this this seems extremely politically charged and the medical board should not be politically charged. You shouldn't be listening to the CMA. You should be listening to your consumers that are here giving public comment. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, this time, President Lawson, I don't see any additional requests. Thank you, Sean. Just checking one more time in the room. And then before we move on, I wanted to take the opportunity to wish Dr. Thorpe a very happy birthday. <laughs> uh, we will now move on to agenda item five, board member communications with interested parties. 
Do any members have anything to report? Dr. Gananadev. Uh, Ms. Lawson, uh, with the COVID coming to an end, uh, the, all the organization I participate in uh, starting the legislative days. I, as you know, I participated in the medical board, AMPAC, CALPAC, and last month, the CALPAC legislative day, and I was at the Capitol uh, talking to the legislatures, but I do not talk about medical board issues when I'm doing something else there. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional board member communications to report? No, just, just a quick comment. Um, you know, with the lifting of COVID and having face to face meetings, I have not had any face to face meetings, but I plan on doing it. Um, you know, I was on the board of pharmacy for 14 years, and the one thing that I always did is anyone who wants to meet with me, the door is always open. And so hopefully I'll meet with members of the public, I'll meet with the medical association, I'll meet with anyone where my time allows me to meet with them. Um, and so I just want to make that you know, clear. So next time I have some report, you'll know where I'm coming from. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. And uh, like you, that has been my approach uh, you know, to communication with interested parties. And so I've met with a variety of stakeholders, uh, members of associations, members of the legislatures, uh, legislature, of course, you know, members of the organizations uh, that I'll be speaking with as well, and uh, many members of the public uh, since last meeting. Are there other board member communications, Ms. Lubiano? Can you hear me? Try that again. Can you hear me now? Oh. I wanted to report that I had the opportunity to attend the Federation of State Medical Boards annual meeting last month, um, and it was on a public scholarship, so the state didn't have to pay for that, which was good. Um, but it was an amazing opportunity. It was my first time there and I'm told that normally there could be in, there could be thousands of people that attend, but this one was much smaller. So there's probably about maybe 500 people from across the country. You know, many doctors, executives, and staff from medical boards, not only around the country but also around the world. So there were people as far as Africa that came and Canada as well. And for me, the the takeaway was that it was a, that you know. We're all in the same boat. Many of these people on the board, they're passionate about improving and you know, they're experiencing a lot of the things that we see here in terms of trying to improve the enforcement process and getting those timelines down. Also a commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion. There's a lot of work going on there. And so um, another takeaway for me was that it's a resource to find uh, people, you know, committees that want to do the same work that we're doing and they have resources and reports and um, that we can also take advantage of. So I just wanted to share that with everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Liviano. Dr. Hawkins. Thank you. Two months ago, I participated in a Food and Drug Administration Vaccine Advisory Committee as a consumer representative as the FDA tries to uh, deal with this challenging uh, situation of vaccine development and who to vaccine and how to generate vaccines that are protective. Any additional uh, communications from board members? All right, seeing none, I'll ask if there are any public comments in the room. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Watkins, I missed you, I'm sorry. I, I don't know if this is a communication, but I just made public comment at that same business and professions committee on, I don't know what the date was. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. That was on May 6th, I believe. Uh, I believe so. All right, are there any uh, comments from members of the public in the room? Sean, do we have any uh, comments on the WebEx? Anyone like to make a public comment? Please raise your hand through the WebEx application or type anything in the Q&A box. And again, for any call-in users that would like to make a public comment, you can press star three to raise your hand. First up, we have Eric Anders. Eric, you should uh, be receiving that prompt here momentarily. Can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead. Real quick, did I just hear Dr. Dev Gananadev say that COVID's coming to an end? Talk about misinformation. Good Lord, Dev. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Dr. Hannah Reed. Uh, yes, hello. Um, Hannah Reed with Black Patients Matter. 
So um, thank you, Ms. Lubiano, for sharing that information about the recent FSMB meeting. Um, and you're correct um, that uh, people from around the world do attend and that um, eyes, uh, eyes of the world are looking at what we do, we in California do. And so certainly uh, for Black Patients Matter, uh, we are have we have been in touch with the FSMB, their legal counsel, uh, because they are defendants in our federal civil rights lawsuit. Um, so what what um, needs to happen is is caution. So like most things in life, uh, it's a double edged sword. FSMB is a great um, place to caucus with other states and see how they're resolving their issues, but it also is a, a method in which um, minorities and uh, black patients, African-American patients can, can get marginalized. So I would caution you about um, the FSMB that um, there needs to be changes uh, which occur and so um, that that's just my comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your public comment. Uh, I have one chat question I'll reply to President Lawson, but other than that, you are, uh, are th there's no additional questions. Thank you, Sean. We'll bring it back to the board and then we'll move on to agenda item six, which is updates from external stakeholders. Uh, with Ms. Castro, Ms. Nichols, and Ms. Miller. Ms. Castro, I think you're up first. <clears throat> Fantastic. Good afternoon. It is a real pleasure to get to see real people and real faces and to be in the same room together. I believe we've communicated very effectively, notwithstanding the virtual environment, and we got a lot of work done and everyone should be very, very proud of themselves. Dr. Sai, I'd like to welcome you to this board. And um, just a little bit about who I am. I'm Gloria Castro. I'm the Chief Prosecutor of your administrative litigation, and I'm also in charge of defending this board and these members in civil litigation and also other matters to assist you in effectuating your most important mission. So first off, um, I wanted to give a staffing update and then go ahead and for the benefit of the new board members um, to hear a little bit more briefly um, because you will be seeing us in our work pretty soon. So first off, our staffing update is that our supervising deputy attorney general, James Beck Simon, is departing for retirement as is uh, DAG-5 Lawrence Mercer and DAG-5 Martin Hagen. And collectively, they represent a century of legal practice. And so while we are sad and happy at the same time it's bittersweet, we are welcoming new staff members. So today I have with me um, Deputy Attorney General Kendra Rivas and our newest DAG here in Sacramento, Kalev Kase Oru. So we're privileged to be your law firm within the Attorney General's office. And uh, we're specially created by statute, Government Code Section 12529. And by extension, we serve the people of the state of California through your important mission, which is memorialized in law. It's at Business and Professions Code Section 2001.1, and we enforce your Medical Practices Act. Now, our team is very energetic in your work and committed to it. And like I said, it's enforcement of the Medical Practices Act, all of your important work to, reach you, to assist you in reaching your important disciplinary outcomes which are listed in Business and Professions Code Section 2227. It is the medical board's role to adopt not only to consider our stipulated settlements that we bring to you for your consideration, but also the Office of Administrative Hearings, which has a specified medical quality panel that is specifically geared to serve your work, which is highly technical, scientific, contentious, and very, very critically important people's lives are literally at stake in all of this important work. And so we stay in our lane of expertise in the health quality enforcement section. We are experts in your laws and regulations. We are experts in 
resourcing your cases to the best uh, possible posturing that will allow us to charge as strongly as possible. And we're very, very open and honest, whether you like the advice or not, to tell you really how we see it, how we see this going. But it's always, always at the end of the day, your decision and your decision alone, which we support in every respect. We respect the process, which is using medical experts to evaluate medical professionals. And how do we do this? Well, it is through them and only them, through their expertise, to tell us what the standard of care is in the great state of California. Now, your laws and regulations also assist my team to be able to find legal violations. And so your Medical Practices Act also give us the tools that we need to proceed where we just see a legal violation. And in some of those, not all of them, we can't proceed without an expert, but there are very few of those. We always seem to need the evaluation of an expert to be able to tell us what is and isn't medical practice. Now, um, like I said, we're the Department of Justice. I'm the head of the Health Quality Enforcement Section. We're your boutique law firm in the Attorney General's Office and our number one virtue is justice. So that means just behavior, just treatment, teamwork, citizenship, loyalty, social responsibility, ethical obligations at every time. And I heard a caller call in, yes, and doing the right thing even when no one is watching. So we operate zealously and fairly with no prejudgment. For us, fairness and bias-free work is the critical hallmark of what we do for you day in and day out through the 70 legal professionals that we retain at the Health Quality Enforcement section. We're not prejudiced in favor or against any group, and we don't have favoritism, and we serve you in your important and critical mission. And with that, that concludes my comments, and thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to be here today. I truly appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Castro. Uh, Ms. Nichols, and we'll take board member questions, comments uh, after all of the presentations. Good afternoon. I am Deputy Chief Kathleen Nichols. It's my pleasure to update the board on the Division of Investigations Health Quality Investigation Unit. But before I do, I'd like to introduce you to DFI's new chief, Terrence Brass. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chief Nichols. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as mentioned, I am Terrence Brass. I am the uh, brand new chief here at uh, Department of Consumer Affairs, Division of Investigation. Uh, and I just wanted to take the opportunity to address the board. I wanted to share with you some of my priorities for the Division of Investigation uh, over the next uh, time period. Number one, I will continue to foster, promote, and encourage DOI's relationship with all the entities that we interact with at the medical board. Um, I have a vision of not just having a professional relationship with the entities at the uh, medical board that we interact with, but having an invaluable partnership. Uh, number two, continue to foster transparency at all stages of a DOI investigation, whether that be through breeze, work notes, or DOI special reports, or case reviews. Uh, I envision a process where entities that we interact with at the medical board uh, at all times can determine the progression of a investigation at DOI. Uh, most important, continue training. Continue training our investigators uh, to do timely and thorough investigations. And the last thing I wanted to mention is we are actively recruiting college students, students that are near graduation. Uh, we have partnered with California State University Sacramento uh, to offer a student internship program. Um, students will learn the basic basic information about DCA and DOI and what we do in protecting consumers in our state. Uh, we are in the process of seeking out other colleges near our field offices, colleges and, and universities, uh, in hopes to partnering with them for some, part, uh, for some uh, more student internships. So these are some of my priorities. Uh, I am hopeful that they will provide a greater service to California consumers, uh, DCA and the medical board. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to uh, uh, Deputy Chief Nichols, thank you. At the end of May, HQIU will have 21 investigator vacancies, which is a 25% investigator vacancy rate. 
There are 17 candidates in background and seven of those are in the final stages, so we anticipate clearance very soon. We continue to conduct hiring panels to identify additional candidates in order to immediately fill the remaining vacancies. And then we submitted some updated graphs. We have continued to make progress on our age cases. The number of cases over a year old has continued to trend down and our pending workload is down to 1,475 cases, which is 865 less investigations than were pending in January of 2020. One of the other efficiencies we identified was to add a fifth analyst position to our expert procurement unit, utilizing existing positions. I am pleased to report that the fifth analyst position has been hired and started on May 16th. On June 1st, we will be transitioning the responsibility to reconcile record certifications from our investigative staff to EPU. This will allow investigators to spend more time on their investigative workload and help us to continue to bring down the timeline. Our investigators are attending a five and a half hour training on sexual misconduct investigations provided by CLEAR, which is the Council on Licensure Enforcement and Regulation, which includes training on interviewing victims of trauma. Some investigators completed this training earlier in May and the rest of the training sessions are scheduled for July and August 2022. We continue to hold weekly meetings with board staff to discuss aged and priority cases, in addition to sending an automated monthly report with case status updates. We look forward to our continued meetings with board staff, and this concludes our update. Thank you, Ms. Nichols. And I think the next update is from the Department of Consumer Affairs. Ms. Miller. Good afternoon. I regret wearing heels today. <laughs> All right, good afternoon. I'm Brianna Miller with the Department of Consumer Affairs Board and Bureau Relations. Thank you for allowing me an opportunity to provide a department update to your board today. And before I get started, I'd like to congratulate board member Sai and, and Zhang uh, on your recent appointments to the board. Member Sai, congratulations and welcome aboard and thank you for your commitment to serving California's consumers. And also, um, as I understand that this may be the last meeting for members Ganadev and Yip, who I know is, is not here, on behalf of DCA, we do want to thank you for your years of service on the board and for your continued commitment to California's consumers as well. So thank you. All right, I'd like to start my update with a note about the transition back to in-person meetings. On April 1st, boards and bureaus returned to meeting in accordance with all aspects of the Open Meeting Act, including publicly noticing all meeting locations. There is legislation, AB 1733, which would permanently allow boards and committees to meet remotely, while also providing both virtual and physical options for members of the public to participate. Unfortunately, this bill was, bill was not heard in committee before the deadline, therefore it will not move forward this year. If your board took a position or is planning to take a position on this legislation, it may still be helpful to share this information with the authors and committees. Please be sure to send a copy of your position letter to Jennifer Simoes, Deputy Director of Legislation, so that she can facilitate this communication. Next, I will be collecting, oh, next a note about DCA's open meeting survey. DCA will be collecting surveys until further notice to capture and track the costs and attendance for all meetings since April 1st, when all aspects of the Open Meeting Act resumed, to demonstrate the benefits of conducting remote meetings as allowed under the prior executive order. We have distributed to all board and bureau leadership a request that staff complete this survey 30 days after each meeting held. So should you have any questions, please reach out to board and bureau relations. Next, to note about appointments and recruitment. Uh, DCA wants to help keep your board fully seated with excellent members and diverse voices. So currently the board has two vacant positions, the licensed faculty member and a public member, member, both appointed by the governor. And then we also have a few members, a couple members nearing their grace period. So please know that Board and Bureau Relations is here to assist and that DCA's communications team recently released a new communications toolkit to assist boards with member recruitment that's available in multiple languages and individuals who are interested in appointment can also visit the board member resources page found on DCA's homepage to apply for an appointment. Next, I'm pleased to announce the release of the DCA Enlightened Licensing Report. DCA is pleased to announce the inaugural report of the Enlightened Licensing Project is now available and was distributed to all boards and bureaus on Friday, May 13th. This innovative and collaborative project was started to streamline and uh, and enhance the licensing processes by utilizing the knowledge and expertise of subject matter experts within DCA sports and bureaus. This inaugural project was conducted in partnership with the Board of Registered Nursing 
And after a thorough ass assessment of BRN's licensing processes, the project's co-chairs provided recommendations to introduce new ideas and implement best practices for critical licensing activities. DCA hopes that all boards and bureaus can learn from this report and implement recommendations where applicable. Next, an update on the Enforcement Monitor RFP. The department has been working since late 2021 to implement the enforcement monitor requirements of SB 806, the board sends a bill passed last year. The department did not receive any proposals for its first two requests for RFPs. The department re released a third request for a proposal on March 30th, 2022, seeking a contractor, and the RFP closed on May 16th. The department received two proposals. After evaluating both proposals, it was determined that one proposal was responsive. Accordingly, the department intends to award the contract to Alexan RPM, which is a California consulting firm with decades of auditing experience and has worked with over a dozen of California state agencies. The department anticipates starting activities with the board in mid-June. All right, moving on to key leadership positions filled at DCA. I'm excited to share that three new members of the DCA executive team um, began serving in March. Tanya Corcoran began serving as the department's first compliance and equity officer, effective March 2nd. And in her role, she oversees solid training and planning, organizational improvement office, EEO, and the internal audits office. Additionally, you met Mr. Terrence Bratt, um, who joined us effective March 28th as the chief of division of investigation. And last but not least, Adon Prahadi was selected to serve as the department's internal audits chief, also effective March 28th. And on the other side of that spectrum, I'd like to notify you of some changes in Board and Bureau Relations. Carrie Holmes, Deputy Director of Board and Bureau Relations, has left Department of Consumer Affairs. Her last day was excuse me, May 13th. And with mixed emotions, I'd like to share that my last day with DCA will be Friday, June 10th, as I've accepted another position with another state agency. DCA has been my home for many, many years and has provided me with so many great opportunities, including the ability to meet and form relationships with so many wonderful people. So I will miss DCA greatly and appreciate um, the home it has been for me for the past several years. And with that in mind, please rest assured that during this transitional period, DCA's executive office and board and bureau relations um, will continue to ensure continuity of service to your board. Okay, and finally, reminder, the next board member orientation training is June 15th. So board members who are recently appointed or reappointment or reappointed need to attend the board member orientation training within a year of that date. You can register for the live virtual training through the Learning Management System or LMS, uh, which is BCA's training portal. And the remaining trainings for this year will be June 15th and October 12th. So that concludes my presentation. As always, Board and Bureau Relations is here to help your board. If there's anything we can do to assist you, please do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Ms. Miller, thank you for those updates, and we wish you the best of luck in your new position. We will miss you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the members for any uh, of the uh, on any of the updates? All right, we'll start with Dr. Hawkins, and I see I see the other hands. Oops. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so change is good, and I want to take the opportunity to welcome and congratulate Mr. Bass, um, and hopefully with fresh eyes that uh, we'll be able to improve our mutual goals of the board and his department. Second, I really want to draw attention to the Attorney General's office and Ms. Castro, and really thank her, the DAGs, and the supporting staff for the value that they brought to the panel um, in the discussions of the cases that we often wrestle with. Thank you both and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Uh, Dr. Yonanadev? Uh, uh, thank you, ma'am, ma madam. So it's uh, for Ms. Nichols. Uh, I still concerned that 25% vacancy rate, is it improving, getting worse, or are they get trained by us and go to another agency? What's going on? Well, it's a historical issue with the vacancy rate. And so the vacancy rate has gone up. Um, as you've noticed, 25% is a lot. Um, but we are working on expeditiously filling those positions. Um, but the fact of the matter is a lot of it has to do with salary. So our investigators were paid much less historically. Um, we fought to increase that salary. In 2017, our investigators were given a 7.44 salary increase. 
and also the Department of Insurance also got that increase. Then the following contract year, they brought all the investigative agencies up to that same bar, so we were all equal. And then in September of last year, DOJ signed a side letter with CalHR, which gave them a 12% raise. They were already 5.5% more than us. So what that did is now their agents make 17.5% more. And so right away we had eight investigators notify us that they were in background to leave. And it's hard to compete with that. That is a significant amount of money. And the caseload where they're going, a lot of the, the investigators who go to medical fraud, they have a caseload of five, five investigations, where we give our investigators up to 35 complex cases at once because that's our workload. Um, so it is a continual problem, but it's one we're working on. Our investigators are extremely dedicated. Um, they like the mission. They like protecting consumers. And we're doing our best to fill these positions. Um, as Chief Brash mentioned, we're recruiting at colleges. At the college level, those at the entry level that might find an interest and a passion. Um, so when we do our hiring panels, we're really looking to get good matches, people that are not just in it, for the dollar or whatever the case may be, but truly have an interest in the work. And that's how we're going to retain staff. So we are going back to the bottom. After we spent twice, I think, to really raise the salary, we, we can't compete with the workload. I understand that because we, medical board investigators have a lot more workload compared to the others. But it's somewhat sad to see that we are back to the same place where we were just about right in filling the portions up and we're going back into a vacancy. So I think we got a problem. Even though your timelines are getting better, our goal is to really uh, cut down the timeline so that we can uh, close both for the consumer and for the doctor, both. Right, and in November of 2020, our vacancies were down to four. So we, we got there, and then now we're, we're dipping back. Um, but the investigator's contract is up a year from July, so fairly soon they'll start negotiating that new contract. And I'm optimistic that in that contract, our members will, you know, be raised up a little bit enough to keep them. Mr. Brooks? This is for uh, Ms. Miller. It's more of a uh, you know, comment or observation than a question. I know you're putting together the costs of the um, public meetings uh, for a report, but I'm hoping you'll have a little asterisk at the bottom because everything is not just about the physical costs, right? It's the human costs, it's the interactions, it's the, you know, having the public being able to come in and you know, per day, work with the board members on an individual basis. And sometimes that gets lost just in the numbers, right? So hopefully there will be a narrative, a part of that report that reflects that. And so that's just, once again, more of an observation than a question. Thank you. We appreciate it. And we'll note it. Very yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Dr. Thorpe? Thank you, Thank you Ms. Lawson. Um, I just want to re reiterate uh, with Dr. Gnanadev had said, and it, it, it's obviously uh, a very large concern that our investigative staff is at the uh, vacancy rate that they're at. And, and as Ms. Nichols pointed out, how can you compete when your uh, salary rate is 17.5% less and your workload is like 500% more? Um, it, it does. It does appear that we that, that the state bureaucracy itself sort of is competing against itself, and that I don't know what the solution to that is, but it does seem like that's what we need to address, and not just constantly be chasing our tail. Um, and, and just as if I could add on one other comment, I I, I think it's really important what, Dr., what Mr. Brooks pointed out, and that is that. There is obviously a fiscal cost to these meetings, but um, there's been a significant um, uh, dynamic loss uh, when you are not meeting in person. And uh, it, it's, it, it's really interesting. You know, it, I, I've seen everybody's faces on the, on the web action, but it was really interesting. I had a hard time recognizing some people because I had no idea 
that they were that tall or that short or whatever, you know. So it's. <laughs> he looks at me. <laughs> I did not look at you, but you are the one I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but it, I think it, there is a there is a dynamic that occurs when you're meeting in person when you have a chance to actually exchange. Not not necessarily. I mean, we do change exchange information regarding board issues, but it's other qualities that help you decide how to how to value another person's uh, uh, perspective. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thorpe. Mr. Watkins, I saw your hand. I've got a question for Ms. Nichols. Uh, first, thank you for that presentation at uh, Business and Professions. The contrast really enlightened me about giving some perspective on what the issues look like in an ideal world and the reality of what we are facing. So I, I'm, I'm kind of clarifying all of our expert issues because currently that is the burning issue since our last board meeting where it really showed up. And my question, and I think this is on your end of it, because it's, it, it apparently touches everybody, is do your office pick the first medical expert that is chosen in, one, in the quality of care cases? Our, our expert procurement unit, where the cases go, they select the experts, but that's based off a list. We get a list of experts from the medical board, and it's broken down by specialty. So they find the best match for that particular case by looking at the CVs of all the experts, what was the procedure or the treatment in question, and then matching that up with the best appropriate expert that's on the list. And then when they contact that expert, they have a whole list of screening questions they ask that expert, how much you know, familiarity they have with that procedure or treatment during the time period where our case took place. They make sure there's no conflicts or that the expert doesn't know the physician. And they go through a pretty thorough checklist of screening before the case actually gets sent. So you vet the first expert. You thoroughly vet the first expert. So sometimes in these cases, especially some of the quality of care cases, there's a second expert. Though did the second expert also go through that same procedure but chosen by your office? Yes. Okay, thank you. My next set of questions, same vein, is to Ms. Castro. <laughs> so my question is, you know, in the quality of care cases that we experience, I just want to understand, you know, the reason behind getting that second expert, and I'll, 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 I'll follow up while I'm asking that, because yesterday, and very educational, you know, I got on my notes when I reviewed it last night that the single patient quality of care cases always has two experts. Then that didn't work because then it was a judgment call. Uh, the DAG makes a judgment call. And then there was also, when I made a few more mis mistakes, as I call it, there was a, pro a proximity of opinion to the defense expert. Maybe you can just clarify that for me because all I want to know is the reasoning behind choosing a second expert. And I know it's sometimes to save us costs and save us from going to trial. That's my first question, I've got three. So first off, there is no rule uh, on a single patient case that we will always require two experts um, to review that. And as duly noted by Mr. Watkins, the Attorney General's office does not pick the experts. We don't collect the evidence. We are given a finished product by Chief Brass and um, Chief Nichols, and we review the evidence for materiality for substance, for authentication, and to see if we can use it to substantiate charges. Expert evidence is no different than any other evidence, whether it be a witness interview and such. There is no hard and fast rule, Mr. Watkins, 
and um, to try and fit it into a rubric is going to be exceedingly frustrating, I think. But without getting too much into the deliberative process, which I will not get into um, within the context of the stipulation discussions that we have with you. Um, the, there is an ordinary and generally accepted standard of care. Um, and then there are also areas where it is so obvious and it's so generally accepted that we don't need an expert to let us know certain things, such as the basic taking of a patient history, the HMP, the so-called history and physical examination that doctors are expected to do, treatment plans with objectives. You all know SOAP. I don't need an expert to tell me that doctors should have, at the very least, in a medical record SOAP. Informed consent, periodic review of treatment's efficacies, and, of course, adequate or accurate medical record keeping. Now, the standard of care is measured in California from the acceptable practice, Mr. Watkins, during the relevant time period. So our job is to look back and see what the doctor did at the time he saw, he or she saw the patient, and also what a reasonably prudent person or doctor in the same position, seeing the same patient at around the same time, should have done. And that's what we need the expert for. Um, so every case is different, Mr. Watkins. We manage about 600 of these matters per year. You sit on one panel. You do see a few of them. We resolve many cases with surrenders that you never see. Uh, we resolve others by going in front of the Office of Administrative Hearings and Administrative Law Judges of the Medical Quality Panel, and they revoke those licenses. And the bottom line is, if we have a good expert, we can be pitted against the biggest, best expert. But if our expert has it right, is credible, experienced, and can articulate why the standard of care is what it is, then we will win. But we always are calculating that assessment by the quality of the evidence, and it's a judgment call. Now, a prosecutor in the state of California is bound by many things, and, and every attorney is bound by the rules of professional conduct, um, our own internal guidelines, our duty to help you execute the government's authority over your licensees. And as such, government lawyers that represent entities such as this, public agencies, it is our call to be fair and to be just. And like I said in my opening remarks to Dr. Sai, as I was walking him, him, we stay in our lane. We are the experts in the law. We usually need medical experts to tell us what the medicine is. Even if I sort of kind of know from having been in this section since 2005 and having managed and supervised thousands of these, I'm no doctor. I'm a lawyer. I still need the help of a doctor to tell me what the standard of practice is. Now, on a single patient case, and usually with one doctor, and there's no other history, it is very critical that we understand what the community practice standard is. And a community is not a community of one, and it's not what I would do. If I was a doctor and said, well, I wouldn't do that, that's not what we ask our experts to do. We ask them, what should this doctor have done? And more importantly, why? And what is it about you, Mr. Expert, Dr. Expert, that makes you so qualified? How many of these lab coleys have you done? Oh, you've done 10,000. When's the last one you did? Oh, five hours ago. Okay, you know what you're talking about. If it's an expert like that and it's stacked against someone who is out of practice, maybe wrote the book on it 20 years ago, is maybe not up to par on what the latest and greatest medicine is, maybe not even knowing what a first year medical student would, should know, we will, we will get them in court. But it is a judgment call. We try to get it right. We try to be fair at all times. And um, once again, the working definition is standard of care. And that's the diagnostic or treatment process that an average prudent physician 
in a given community should follow based on patient illness and clinical presentation. The medical standard of care specifies that appropriate treatment based on scientific evidence, medical community consensus in the community of professionals under similar circumstances. So obviously if somebody is, has taken out the wrong kidney or wrong ovary, we can use a medical consultant to tell us they shouldn't have done that. But not all the cases are going to be that simple. And we don't operate from the best case scenario. Our cases are never that easy. They're always very, very complicated. Um, but we load up for bear to be able to identify whether the expert chosen by your investigators is the one that's gonna get us across the gate. And when not, we ask our client, hey, you know what, we will file this case. I, we believe we n might need another read on this. And it's up to the client to allow us to do that. But if we feel we are ethically able to charge, we will charge with um, whom we have. Um, and sometimes in order to get it right, Mr. Watkins, if we get a second expert and the second expert is divergent from the first expert, we will not file that case. That's the hallmark of justice. And um, it's not a, it's not the answer everyone needs to hear. And like I said, sometimes my job is to tell you what you don't want to hear. Um, but we try to do the right thing. And ultimately, it's, it is your call. And you're guided by Business and Professions Code Section 2234. That's what defines a professional conduct. That's the law. It's great in California because we can evolve with uh, advancements and things we never anticipated, like this pandemic. Who knew, you know? that this was gonna to happen to us and yet here we are. And the development of expertise is great to help weed out the pioneers and the renegades. The pioneers being the people who are advancing medicine and the renegades who are certainly not and are perhaps you know, engaging in quackery and things like that. But I need an expert to tell me that um, so I can stay in your lane. So I hope that answers your question and I regret that I can't get too much more into it um, that, than what I've already attempted to explain so that, that, for your question. That definitely answers a lot. So my, my second, this will be my last question because this is more penetrating. I want to know from you because you, the DAG, your office, when they go and vet the expert after the fact, they continually you know, break them down. There's, there's deficiencies. And so I, my question is, does, do we as the medical board need to review the qualification standard for our expert reviewers? Because if we're looking at, you know, 80 hours a month of patient care or, you know, three years, these, these standards look real low. And it's almost uh, when it arrives at a case against a, you know, highly reputable expert from the defense, it's, it, it, it in many of the cases that I read, it, it's dead on arrival. And I just would love to solve for that. And I don't know if that means there's a, you know, you could, your office could write a, or assist in writing a vetting process that Ms. Nichols' office could uh, apply. But I think that standard needs to be more rigorous so that we can equip or fine, and I know that's difficult to do because we have trouble with that even now, but to find better experts that are willing to, sh to show up because if an expert shows up that has only three years or a limited amount of experience, you know, it, 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 it whenever I read that, I cringe because I, I, I feel that's a solvable problem. So do you, do you have any recommendations for that or ideas? Um, I think we have great experts. We, to date, uh, three quarters into this fiscal year, have revoked or surrendered 132 people um, based on the experts you have. Um, with respect to the second thing about vetting, it's, it's not new, it's a training issue, and I'm very happy to tell you that I've already met with Chief Brass. Um, he met with my colleague and I from the Attorney General's office. Training is 
really what he spoke about, and it is about training the investigators. You have an excellent expert reviewer program. I encourage Dr. Sai and all of you to try and attempt uh, and watch Dr. Yip and Ms. Jones and members of my team and members of Ms. Nichols' team train your expert, your prospective experts, and it's a pro bono sort of thing. It's, these are physicians who are in it, like the prosecutors in my office who don't get paid market rate. We don't even get paid as much as other public agencies. We do it because we love it, and those are the types of experts you have on your roles the ones that are willing to do it for nothing, pretty much. And um, they do a great job and we rely on them. So I would not agree with you, Mr. Watkins, that our experts are not, I don't know if that's what you said and I, don't want, I certainly don't wanna put words in your mouth, but I don't, I don't see an issue when an expert is challenged by someone in my office because guess what's going to happen when they get in court? They are going to be challenged not only by the defendant, I'm sorry, the respondent's counsel, an opposing counsel who's trying to save the doctor's license, they will be questioned very heavily by the administrative law judge of your medical quality panel. Now, Ms. Webb is aware that you, this board trains our judges to know medical evidence and our judges are engaged in the battle of the experts. So while you, Mr. Watkins, see proposed settlements because we foresee um, that it's something that might get you more than if we went to hearing, we're always preparing for hearing because if you reject our proposed settlement, we're going to hearing. And it's always about the experts. It's about the, all the evidence, but really it's about the expert. Because why? It's based on the expert opinion that we formulate our charges that are found in, your, in the accusations that I propose every day of every week um, of every year to Mr. Prasivka for his consideration and his signature. And Mr. Prasivka is my client there. But when you see me at, this, at the proposed stipulation level and when you see the ALJs at the proposed decision level, the client then is you, this corporate body comprised in two panels and divided by the alphabet. Um, so uh, I hope that that helped you understand the process a little more. Um, I know that it's encapsulated in the minutes, but I would encourage you, Mr. Watkins, to watch um, our standard of care presentation, mine, the standard of care presentation of August of 2020, where I explained all of this. I, I did get into battle of the experts. I think Dr. Thorpe asked me some really great questions. I forget who else, so I don't wanna, be mean, I don't remember, several of you asked really great questions and I was able to talk about it. Um, Dr. Krause, who's no longer here, you know, took issue with a couple of things and it was, I always learn every time I am in the same room with you because um, I'm not the doctor in the room, I'm just your lawyer. And um, yeah, so anyway, um, I think the vetting process is, has been, you know, do you know the physician in question? When's the last time you did this practice? Are you qualified, you know? And we find out things after the fact. So our team does reach out to the experts um, when we're formulating the charges. If there's time, if there's no time, then we will talk to our expert um, and get them prepped for their big, big work ahead of them, which is to help us rehabilitate where we can and take away the license where it's inconsistent with public protection. That is your mandate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Watkins, for your question. I appreciate it. Additional questions? Mr. Watkins, are you, are you finished? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thorpe? Um, I just had an additional follow-up. Just uh, briefly, uh, Ms. Castro, could you give us that reference again to where you made the presentation? Was it the presentation you made at the board? Yes, my pleasure, Dr. Thorpe. That was on August 14, 2020. And um, that uh, presentation is found on your website. Um, oh, okay. At, at about, and then click on meetings and you look at the August 2020 meeting. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know what day it would have been, but it's in there. Okay, thank you. Dr. Ganana, did I throw your hand? Yes, thank you. Um, Ms. Castro, I, I do I sometimes sympathize with uh, TJ's frustrations. We. We see it through, but I think one of the 
And we, we feel sometimes that maybe we had weaker experts. I understand that it's, it's but while you were mentioning about the 130 licensees who gave up their licenses, we don't see them. And the only ones we saw, the 20 people we saw yesterday in our panel, maybe 12 or 13 of them, TJ and I felt both the same way, even though I'm a doctor, he's not. Uh, but so I, I, I understand and it's not easy to find medical experts. We have to beg people to be, to do, and it's there from their heart. It's similar to members who sit here. It's the only reason we sit here is because we want to do something for, for me, for the profession I love. So, I mean, so that's what we do. So uh, we get it, but that doesn't mean that we don't get frustrated. So thank you. And this board is more than happy to listen to Ms. Nichols and to, if she cannot find that neonatologist or some pathologist that's really highly specialized in something that is not on your list, um, she can tell you that we can hire, she can hire off the list and um, hire at a different rate and go to Stanford and go to do these things. Those are extenuating circumstances where we do not have an expert in that area of expertise because it's too new or you just haven't attracted someone like that. But I think it's critically important that the experts, I'm sorry, that you attend or at least watch uh, from the comfort of your own home the expert reviewer training. Um, we also have the perspective of the defense counsel um, who tells your experts exactly how it's going to be and what they're going to say and what they're going, getting into. So with respect to Mr. Watkins, um, an expert that sits through that defense uh, counsel presentation and still wants to do it is a hero in my eyes. And um, Beth Faber Jacobs, who was formerly in the health quality enforcement section, she's the judge that we have lucky enough to come and give the perspective of the ALJ, the administrative law judge. She too says, look, man, you need to be calm. Your, your job is not to be an advocate. Your job is to listen to the question and answer it and don't take sides. If she were here, she would probably t say that that was a good paraphrase of you know, her, her presentation. So it is critical and we take it seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. I saw your hand. Yeah, one last follow-up for Ms. Castro. I know you're trying to leave there. I, I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. You've done such a great job in your presentation today. I really, truly appreciate it. Um, you know, one of the criticisms of this board is, you know, we're not, you know, prosecuting you know, doctors. There's no disciplinary, um, not enough discipline with doctors, not re uh, revoking enough licenses. Does your office keep the numbers, the total number of cases that come in, um, say it's 10,000, maybe four or 5,000 are irrelevant because it should have been at the dental board or should have been at the board of pharmacy and whittle those down to the number of cases that are actually relevant and of those relevant cases, do we know what the outcomes are? And is that in a document anywhere we can present? to show the true number, because my gut tells me it's a little bit more than 1% what's been reported out there in the press. Uh, can you re repeat what the 1%? Uh, There's been, you know, in the press we've heard different numbers that the medical board is only revoking 1% of licenses oh. or 2% of licenses. Uh, they'll look at the total number of complaints that come in, but a large portion, maybe 40 or so percent, I've been told, aren't relevant to this board, so they can refer to, to, refer to other boards. I would love to see um, a spreadsheet that outlines the total number of cases that are relevant, and out of those cases, how many cases have been dismissed, how many of those cases are steps, how many of those cases are revocations. Uh, does your office have that information? If so, can you provide it? Uh, the short answer to that is that the custodian of the outcomes, that's in, the, in your annual reports. So uh, at, the, at the conclusion of every year, like in December, you, this board puts out the annual reports of the outcomes. But number two, with respect to your specific question, we do in the Attorney General's office report on the accusations filed on behalf of Department of Consumer Affairs license, uh, licensing agencies, which includes this healthcare oversight agency. Um, that is found on our website. It's uh, under statute business and professions code section 312.2. It's in a line with DCA statistics that they have to publish under 312.1 and OAH statistics 312.3. So the legislature thought it important enough that the Attorney General should report on how many cases come in, 
how many cases we send to our client for filing, um, and the average number of days between those markers, how many cases are withdrawn. So that is where at the end of the day, the case is withdrawn, we withdraw the charges because something's fallen apart. And most of those are because the physician regrettably passes away, so there's, we withdraw those. Um, so we do keep track of how long it takes us to get you what you need, but with, if you don't pay attention, and I appreciate the question, to what outcomes you achieve, then it's, it, it almost doesn't matter how much it takes as long as it's the strongest possible outcome from the perspective of the Attorney General's office. Um, and we try to do the work as quickly as possible yeah. because this is a, um, the patient wants to know the answer, the doctor wants to know the answer, and we want to get the case in front of you so you can make the ultimate decision. Um, so no, I don't keep too many to track of outcomes. I know that the meeting minutes sort of suggested that, but I believe that it's the annual reports that has all the outcomes. Yeah. And if I may scoot over here. Um, so in the meeting minutes for this particular meeting, in agenda item 8B, um, the very last page, which is um, board agenda item 8B, page 15, um, you have fiscal by fiscal year breakouts of how many cases resulted in surrenders, revocations, public reprimands, and probation. Um, so while our client may vet some of those numbers uh, through us to make sure that you know it's it's right or whatever. We always are comparing back and forth uh, on just a few numbers, but not everything. And um, we kind of focus on the legal. We don't. We're not. We're not a. We, we do collect data, but the data that we produce is is pursuant to legislative statute. Um, but we own these outcomes with you, and um, no, I, I question that statistic about the 1% and the 10,000. I don't track your complaints. I will say that Mr. Viatoro was here when Breeze came on board and it enhanced the ability of consumers to file complaints. So complaints shot up from 6,000 to 10,000, and that resulted in a marginal uptick in the number of cases that we filed. But your Physician licensee population has remained relatively stable at like 180,000. Um, so there's different ways to to articulate um, things, and I don't know that without seeing the data, um, and I've expressed this to Mr. Watkins, without me seeing the data that is being cited to say there's deviations from this, so we're not. Doing, I, I'm at a loss to be able to assist. Um, but you know, I don't agree with with that. Oh, okay. I, I, I appreciate it. I mean, yeah. I've done a deep dive into some of the data and the mm -hmm. ways presented in our annual report, and I have read that uh, over and over and over again and analyzed it in many different ways. Um, I'm just hoping, you know, we can work better, you know, with your office to provide data that's accurate. Um, yes. Because yeah. we're going to try to solve a problem, we need to identify what that problem is. Our, our data that we put through um, and out to the public is vetted by the California Research Bureau which is an entity within our office that um, all they do is reports. So they report on sex offender registries, Megan's Law, things like that. Um, all of our data is actually related to milestones that are entered in every case and actual pieces of paper that are produced. So we believe our data is extremely reliable um, and we wouldn't put it out there and put our AG's name on it. Um, so I am more than happy to forward those to your staff, uh, Mr. Brooks, and um, to ensure that you get what we have and we can begin that discussion because we're here to improve. Um, we d take to heart patients' um, feelings about how the process is going for them. Um, and we do hear from patients who are extremely happy with the outcomes. Um, they send thank you cards to our DAGs and are very happy. Um, and I'm sure the staff has also received um, those kinds of, of comments. Um, but we're here for the folks who are not very happy with the process, and I want to improve it for them. Um, and, and, even if the, and even if it's the patient or the doctor that's unhappy with the process, we're, I come to these meetings to listen and improve where we can. 
and recreate um, old things from things that worked previously that maybe were scrapped um, too quickly that we should look at again. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments from board members? All right. Are there any questions or comments from members of the public in the boardroom? All right. Seeing none, Sean, uh, could you find out if there's any public comments on WebEx, please? Yes. Anyone wishing to make a public comment, please go ahead and raise your hand or type something into the Q&A window. Uh, I see a few more call-in users, so please, if, you'd, if you're only on the phone, uh, you can press star three to raise your hand that way as well. First up, we have Eric Andrews. Can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead. First, kudos to your videographer. Good job with the picture and picture shots. It really helps to be able to see the board's faces while other people are speaking, especially when they're nodding off. Second, TJ, it's clear that quality experts want nothing to do with this failing board. Who wants to hop on a sinking ship? You can't even keep the board member positions filled because clearly doctors won't, don't want to be affiliated with this board and you won't allow patient safety advocates to serve. So there hasn't been a full complement of the board in years. But Gloria thinks the experts are great. So what does that also tell us about the AG's office standards? I think a lot. Ryan, thank you for the questions about the numbers. It's hard to even trust the annual report since the nursing board was caught fabricating reports to the state auditor's office. How do we know that the reports this board puts out are even accurate? Third, why were the panel hearings kept from the public yesterday? Is this one of your solutions to being more transparent and informative to the public? <clears throat> Lastly, oh, Gloria Castro, you're such a bullshitter and you always choose to speak down to TJ Watkins. You can give information to him without making it sound like you don't appreciate his questions. If you can't be respectful to him, maybe the state needs to find someone else who can be. You were that way with Judge Feinstein when she questioned you as well. Remember, I have the video and, and this video is on video today. So your number one virtue is justice and you try to do the right thing. Is that difficult for you? Why don't you tell the new board members about the all the egregious cases you barter away in the name of expediency and cost saving measures? Why do you always talk as though your office always does the right thing when clearly that's not true? Last meeting, I quoted the case of a fertility doctor who sexually assaulted six women on and this board with the help of the AG's office bartered his case down to a public reprimand, which disappeared after 10 years. His profile on your website is totally clear now, and he's apparently gone on to sexually assault more women, and there is a new lawsuit pending. In his disciplinary document, it clearly says when he was given a public reprimand, quote, for purposes of the settlement of the action pending against the respondent and to avoid a lengthy administrative hearing. That's why his case was bartered down to a public reprimand. That is not virtue and justice, the virtue of justice. Tell the, women or, tell the woman or the women that he's gone on to sexually assault because this board let him off the hook to avoid a lengthy administrative hearing that your number one virtue is justice. Shame on you, Gloria Castro. And DC, a DCA rep, will you be hearing from patient safety advocates for recommendations on new board members, or does the DCA only take recommendations from the California Medical Association? Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have uh, Brianna. Brianna, could you pronounce your last name for me just so I know for Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Why is there a lack of transparency with individuals who file complaints? Why are complainants not being notified that charges have been filed from the DA office? Why are complainants not being notified if that administrative action has been made? It's been several months and I have yet to hear that the doc, Dr. Yang has a public reprimand. I had to go on the website myself to find this information. How is it possible that a doctor who had substantiated negligence and breached the standard of care can continue to practice and possibly seriously harm other patients? A public reprimand is a slap on the wrist and does nothing to no one if they are, if nobody checks the medical board. Who is responsible for reporting settlements over 30K and who is ensuring that reporting is accurate and actually being made in a timely manner? How can a complainant feel confident that medical expert reviews are being reviewed carefully, carefully and accurately if, as you guys stated, they are being swamped with cases to review? Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Dr. Hannah Reed. 
Yes, hello, thank you. Uh, so this is uh, Dr. Ree with Black Patients Matter. So Brianna, please take a look at Ms. Castro's face. Remember her face. That is the face of a liar. So Ms. Castro is lying. Her statements are untrue. They are not consistent with the facts or the events in which they have occurred. Um, the AG's office, the Attorney General's office in California is corrupt. She represents uh, all the cases from 2005 to the present, which has shown to go after African American physicians at a higher number than non uh, African American um, physicians. That represents a high number of Black patients as well. And so, her office does not represent justice or fairly or bias free. The reason why Brianna, no one's contacted you. The reason why they don't contact the, the people who complain is because they don't care. They don't care. What they care about is just doing their write ups and getting paid at the end of the day. They care about keeping their job and getting promoted, which I don't blame them. That's what we all have to do. The problem with Castro is that she represents that period of time that went after African American physicians. She needs to step down. We need a change in the AG's office. The AG's office does not care. She is lying about the medical experts. I am here to tell you because I have gone through the whole process. They use me whatever medical experts they can get. If a case calls for an internist, an OBGYN, but they cannot find a medical expert that agrees with them, they will find a family medicine doctor who's not board certified, who's not practicing. They will lower their standards in order to get their case uh, pushed through. They, the reason why they don't go after serious cases is because they are biased. They use their powers in retaliation. For example, we fa we filed federal complaints and civil rights lawsuits. They went after me, and I can tell you, I'm here to tell you, they are very biased. She is the face of discrimination and of liars. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Susan Lauren. Susan, you should be receiving that request on your end. Hello, can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, the, I see some good board members with, who are conscientious, who are looking for answers. And I appreciate you. I see you and I appreciate you. And you're not getting honest answers. And I'm wondering what the process is for vetting doctors as experts who perform scan procedures, for an example, liposuction, which is scientifically proven to cause long-term harm. And the doctor, such as Terry Dubrow, an expert who has been, who was lied in my trial, and I have plenty of information that I've shared and will share again. And um, there's been 10 doctors who have seen, ethical doctors who have seen what Selberger did to me and are horrified at the egregious assault, the DCA, the AG's office, and the medical board all let Salberger get away with this. Now, um, as far as these these experts, I've looked up plastic surgeons alone with groups of other harmed women, a doctor and a, a biochemist um, for a decade. I found desperate reviews for most members of the Los Angeles Society of Plastic Surgeons. These are just the ones I could find. The founders of liposuction, authors of their reference texts developers of their instruments, 172 trainees and fellows listed on Dr. Malcolm Lesseboy's CV, and 299 of the plastic surgeons on CMA list. Some reviewers for Dr. ST voted one of America's best plastic surgeons in 2021, recommended by other plastic surgeons are scathing. I constantly find predictable, desperate reviews by women. Men are harmed too. They ask good questions and are lied to. You can't use board certified plastic surgeons. You can't have a group of quacks um, bringing justice against other quacks. 
And why all the talk, I, I mean, sexual assault, terrible, but so is surgical assault. And you never talk about that. It's like you want to act like it doesn't exist. Every time you say sexual assault, add, and surgical assault, seriously, each one of you, what is wrong with you? Would you like to be surgically assaulted? Because I'll tell you what, it's a living hell. And what is wrong with you? Christina Lawson, you get an award for what? I asked you specifically to do something to stop these surgical assaults. You never right? talk about it. Do something right for a change. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Christina Hildebrand. Give me just a moment to your line here. Christina, you should begin that request on your end. Can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Great, Christina Hildebrand, a voice for choice advocacy. Um, I agree with the commenter previously. It's amazing to me to listen to Ms. Castro talk completely in a derogatory manner. I mean, the, it, she just exudes it when she's talking to TJ Watkins. I appreciate the board members that have asked questions and, and are really trying to drill down on this, but gosh, listening to her respond is, is you know, she's a lawyer, she's professional, supposedly, doesn't, doesn't exude professionalism. My comments are again coming back to standard of care. I did watch her presentation in 2020 on standard of care. She said in this comment that there were that that standard of care allows for i don't have the exact words but the differentiation between advancements and quackery and that that it uh, it allows for more than just standard of care that's just not the case it's not the case we've seen with with doctors who have been brought before the medical board on vaccine issues where they have written medical exemptions based on the latest research that is being done worldwide. And the medical board brings in their expert, which is most likely a CMA doctor who is following, yes, standard of care. But we shouldn't be, that's not good enough here in California. And I get that the, I get that, you know, some of this is in legislation, but this medical board wants, needs to do better. You need to ask for better from the legislature if you feel like you're being, being told that standard of care is what we should be going for. I come back to my cancer treatment. Here in California, you must, if you have cancer, you must be treated with chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery. You can be treated with other things, but the law says you have to be treated with one of those three things. If you go to the Mayo Clinic, that's not how you're treated. You're treated with genetic therapy and the greatest advancements. California is behind. We are so behind by keeping with this standard of care and your experts that are dealing with standard of care. Standard of care is what 17 years old, what it takes 17 years for something to, that's researched to get into a doctor's office. That's what we're saying is standard of care here in California. It's not good enough. You should want more. You should want better for the patients in California. And let's look at the advancements. And yeah, sometimes quackery is also an advancement. Let's look at Semmelweis who washed his hands and was put in a mental asylum. Let's look at what people are doing to advance, and we should have learned this in COVID. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Kristen Ogden. Receiving that prompt on your end. Can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Thank you, this is Kristen Ogden. I'm leader of an advocacy group that advocates on behalf of severe, extreme, intractable pain patients, families for intractable pain relief. I have a couple of comments regarding um, what we've just heard about um, investigators and expert reviewers. I have a huge concern that as a new updated opioid prescribing guideline is completed and published by the CDC and by the Medical Board of California, it will be essential 
to ensure that investigators and expert reviewers who are selected understand the needs of some intractable pain patients to be prescribed unusually high doses of opioid pain medications as a last resort treatment when all else has failed. Doctors who care for such patients must not be assumed to be excessive or inappropriate prescribers. Effective care of intractable pain patients can only be resumed in an environment where doctors, pharmacists, and patients too are not improperly targeted by investigators or improperly evaluated by self-appointed expert reviewers who are great, greatly all affected by this society-wide stigma directed against intractable pain patients. The mere use of opioid pain medications is enough to bring stigma on those people, and I spoke about that at the last meeting. It will take a lot more than updated guidelines to again enable effective and compassionate medical management of intractable pain patients. You have a pain patient's bill of rights in the law in California. We heard a comment about doctors who may be not up to date. I'm sure there are some, but I would like to also say that a doctor's age has no bearing on their level of competence or their knowledge. Doctors with 40 or 50 years of experience doing what they do as a leader in their field who are widely known and widely respected, please ask your investigators and your expert reviewers to be cautious in 30 seconds, right? possibly taking actions based on a incomplete knowledge of the very, very complex patients that such doctors treat. It's fair to say that every patient and every family in the advocacy group that I lead has been harmed over the last several years as a result of such actions taken by investigators and expert reviewers. We need better than that. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Michelle Montserrat Ramos. So you should be receiving a prompt on your end. Good afternoon, board members. I am Michelle Montserrat Ramos and I'm with Consumer Watchdog. Thank you, Ms. Castro. But I assure you that none of the advocate families that I work with are sending you or the board thank you letters. None of these families have received the accountability they were seeking for the deaths of their family members. That is why they are so active in these meetings. My advocate moms and advocate families are not receiving any letters as well. The DAGs are not keeping their word with California families and this issue needs to be addressed. There is little to no communication with the public at all. We have talked about transparency with the board. We need the panel hearings webcast again so the public has the opportunity to watch them and can learn how the process works because the website and the board's gives them the information a public needs to adequately provide you with information you need in their consumer complaints. Please bring the panel here in webcast and transparency back. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Except we have Virginia. Go ahead, Virginia, we can hear you. Okay, for the standard of care, I have a lot of concerns because it took over 100 doctors to figure out my pelvic pain in three years. So whose standard of care are you using? None of those doctors besides like two of them, one a nurse practitioner actually, knew what they're doing enough to help me. With the C. diff infection, the standard of care was shitty, literally. For mental health, the standard of care is way out of debt, um, way out. There's brain gut access, there's MTHFR, COMT, trauma, diet, et cetera, et cetera, that affects mental health. The standard of care is giving somebody pills and pills to treat the pills and pills to treat the pills without them understanding the pills are often the root cause of the symptoms. So I'm really concerned about 
these experts and their standards of care and how accurate they are. And also, you have people, once again, bleeding to death for 10 hours, and they just get probation. You remember Redonda, who did lots of medical errors, she lost her nursing license and almost had to spend time in jail. Letting people bleed to death for 5 to 10 hours is just as bad. They should not have a license to practice. I'm also concerned about college students being recruited to work on your team. And who's training these college students when many people are leaving? And will they be properly trained? And we don't have enough money to pay for the um, roles that need to be paid for. But remember, CMA lobbied so you guys remain broke. And what is the role in CMA and patient safety when they do things to keep you broke? And how are you supposed to do anything, once again, when the false records are false and the director doesn't care that the records are false and he tells us in a hearing that he's not concerned about the records, which are false. And then he says, I don't have enough evidence for the case. Of course not. The records are false. <clears throat> and embedding, again, you have Terry Bro who lied on cases for patient that lied at trials using his CMA, I mean, using his medical board statute to I don't know what I'm saying anymore. 30 anyways, seconds remain. Oh, anyways, you need that better with Terry Dubrow having federal charges against him and still able to be on the medical board as an expert. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Ann Fuqua. Ann, you shouldn't be receiving that prompt there. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, man, we can. Yes, we can. Hi. My name is Ann Fuquay. Again, um, I'm with National Pain Advocacy Center and Families for Intractable Pain Relief. Um, as uh, Ms. Ogden expressed um, just a few minutes ago, um, probably much better than I, I, I will be able to say. Um, it, yeah, as you're um, revising the intractable pain um, guide yeah, uh, guidelines, which we're going to talk about later, and um, just um, this issue of standard of care and the experts that you um, that, that that you retain um, to serve on these cases, um, I would say that I just hope that you know, like as she said, you know, that you'll look at um, the um, look, you know, uh, uh, look at look, you know, be able to. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the yeah, you know, be able, yeah, be able to to look at the fact that as human beings, you know, there's a great deal of, you know, as much as we have in common, there's a great deal of diversity, and we need to be able to treat people that are outliers and not have them just suffer because they are outliers. Um, you know, there are people that um, do very well with some medications and not well with others. There are people that need higher doses of certain medications, and there are people that you know need lower. And I just hope that you will be able to look to remember that and to be able to look for you know um, to you know. Yeah, to uh, as you um, look for experts and um, seek to um, reduce the caseload. Thanks. Thank you for your public comment. This time, there's no additional requests in queue. Thank you. Any further comments from board members? All right, we will move on to item seven, which is updates from external boards and uh, Dr. Hawk. Hawkins, I think you have an update from the Physician Assistant Board. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to briefly report some of the important activities of the Physician <laughs> Assistant Board, PA Board. I'm a non-voting member of the PA Board appointed by Governor Newsom in August 2020. The Physician Assistant Board last met May 9, 2022 in Sacramento. This was our first in-person meeting since 2020. I reported previously that the PA Board is now independent from the Medical Board of California. The agenda and meeting material, including priors, can be accessed at its homepage at pab.ca.gov. Click on the board meeting link located on the right lower homepage. The May 9, 2022 agenda includes the following reports. Again, details are available for review. There were complaints, discipline, probation, diversion, budget update. Licensing, I would indicate summary of licensing activity included application statistics for the first quarter of this year. There were 426 initial applications 
and 1,842 renewal applications. There are currently approximately 15,600 licensed physician assistants in California. I also want to briefly present some statistics on physician assistant education and workforce programs. There are a total of 287 accredited PA programs in the U.S., a total of 19 accredited PA programs in California, having a current annual capacity of about 883. The average number of students per program is 46. These PA programs continue to have challenges with adequate numbers of clinical sites for PA trainees. The PA Board next meets Monday, August 8th, 2022. I encourage you to uh, go to their website for details. This ends my report. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins, for the update. Are there questions or comments from members? All right, seeing none, are there any questions or comments from the public in the hearing room? All right, seeing none. Sean, are there any public comments on WebEx? Anyone would like to make a public mm -hmm. comment, please raise your hand or type something in the Q&A box. Call and users can press star three. Uh, I'll give anyone here a few seconds to see if anyone queues up. At this time, I don't think we have any public comments. All right, thanks, Sean, and thanks, Dr. Hawkins, for the update. Let's move on to our next agenda item, item eight, executive management reports. Mr. Prasivka. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, you have three reports in front of you. I will try to be brief. Uh, during this period, the executive has been uh, extremely busy. Um, in terms of administrative updates, we've had really constant and regular meetings with the president, the vice president, and with our main stakeholders, who includes uh, the Attorney General's Office, the Health Quality Investigative Unit, uh, other state bodies, uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs, Department of Justice, other of the healing boards. Uh, these are our main stakeholders, and we have a very uh, close, uh, productive uh, partnership with really each of those organizations. Looking at the staffing update, uh, we are currently report a 20, uh, excuse me, a 12.9% vacancy rate. Uh, you will note that this is increased from previous reports where the vacancy rate has been in or around 10%. Uh, I think that what we are experiencing at the medical board is similar to what other state bodies have been experiencing is that there's a renewed difficulty in retaining staff during this emerging post-COVID environment. Many staff members are seeking uh, teleworking opportunities. And in that context, uh, staff retention has become an issue. Um, we obviously are doing everything that we can to both be accommodating to staff in terms of transitioning from teleworking to in-person, but also in terms of recruiting additional staff. And we're very active on both fronts, but it certainly is something that is worth noting. In terms of the budget update, I think in terms of the fund condition overall, during the almost two years that I've been here, I think that the projections and the financial sustainability of the board has uh, progressed along a very predictable path. We are at the point now, which we have long foreseen, where we will need additional funding in order to remain solvent. And so uh, the plan is in June of this year, to receive a $10 million loan. This has long since been flagged, and this will be absolutely necessary um, for us to re re retain our solvency under statutory requirements. What is obviously needed to pay the loan back is a fee increase, and we understand we'll have further discussions about a fee increase later in this year with the relevant uh, committees. In terms of media relations and external communications, this has been an extremely um, active period for the board. On May 11th, uh, Dr. Hilzer appeared before the Senate Rules Committee uh, where he was unanimously confirmed in his appointment. I want to thank Dr. Hilzer for having been so well prepared to having acquitted himself so well, and also Aaron Bone for having prepared all of us 
for this. So again, thank you to Dr. Heelzer. As the President has already said, the 6th of May was a very important day for the Board in that uh, the President led a team of us to appear in the uh, Senate Business and Professions Committee where we had basically four hours of discussions about our legislative proposals. Uh, again, I want to thank Aaron Bone for having done an enormous amount of legwork in setting this up, setting up in the agenda, and getting us very well prepared. Um, the Medical Board does not take the position that business as usual is good enough. And we have a number of very substantive proposals so that we can operate much more effectively and much more efficiently. And we see this uh, the 6th of May as a very important step in giving us the opportunity to make that case. And uh, again, we're under no illusions that we're going to get everything that we want, but we're, we're, we're here for the long term. And we have some very important proposals which go to the core of how we conduct our business in terms of the standard of proof, in terms of the institutional arrangements, in terms of our ability to get records quickly and effectively, which go to the heart of what we do. So uh, I'm very pleased to report that we're making important progress um, on this. On the 4th of May, as the President already said, uh, the President testified in front of legislation to have a public uh, majority. The work of the President has been directly recognized by the Federation of State Medical Boards and uh, certainly uh, the staff is very appreciative of the constant report, the support we receive from the President and her very effectively, uh, effective public uh, uh, presentation of the role in the Board and everything that we do. Also at the Federation of State Medical Boards, our information uh, manager, uh, Carlos Viatoro, also presented there, which is a tribute to the great work that he has done and to its national uh, recognition. I also have made a number of presentations uh, to local groups, and I certainly treat those as a very important priority. It's very important for the board and the staff uh, to meet with a variety of different groups. And if there's any group out there which would like us to make a presentation, please let us know. We are happy uh, to do that. Uh, uh, work continues in other aspects. We will be, uh, we, we continue to work on the development of a complaint, the complainant liaison unit, and we have committed to giving the board a more complete uh, update on what our proposals are. We've done a lot of work in terms of looking at what other boards are doing, and we'll give an update uh, on that work at the August board meeting. The rest here is relates to updates of work that has long been uh, in front of the board, the physician survey uh, redesigned, that development continues on this and testing uh, has begun. The print yourself wallet license generator was officially launched on the 1st of April and website information and forms have been updated to reflect this new system. I know one area that the board has been particularly interested in and that's the complaint tracking system and we're actually prepared now at this point to give you a presentation on that. And so if I can ask Sean uh, to take over at this point. Thank you, Bill. Give me just a sec to get the uh, slides up here. I'm double duty today. trying to make the slides bigger here, but still working out this hybrid thing, so hopefully.
I don't. Hopefully, everyone can see the uh, writing on those slides big enough. I usually like the font size to be size 30 or bigger, but we're still working out this hybrid uh, model here. So, thank you for having me today to provide an update on the complaint tracking system project. Uh, we have been in the process of gathering requirements and have a framework for the minimum viable product that we would like to share with you today to obtain feedback before creating and submitting the stage one business analysis plan as required by the California Information Technology Project Approval Lifecycle per the statewide information manual section 19A. I'll elaborate further on the project management lifecycle at the end of this presentation. The uh, primary objective goal of the system is to allow complainants to easily keep up with the progress of a submitted complaint through the complaint review process. <coughs> the complaint review process is described on the board's website. You can search for complaint review process in our search bar or find it from the consumers tab titled complaint review process. It can be a complicated process sometimes with long periods of time between traditional paper letter updates being sent to the complainant to notify them of changes in the status of their complaint. During this process, complainants have to reach out to board staff via phone or email for status checks, which are time consuming for complainants and for board staff, and only then they are only available during regular business hours. Paper letters take time to deliver via postal mail and come with the inherent risk of getting lost, misdelivered, etc. Additionally, because of resource limitations, paper letters cannot be generated every time an update is made to a complaint. An online portal solves many of these limitations by providing by being available to complainants with nearly 24-7 uptime. It can provide all, reliant and, all relevant and accessible information in a single interface for the life cycle of the complaint, and it doesn't rely on any external delivery services. Uh, privacy and security is obviously a, a main point of the system, so to maintain the privacy and security of the information related to each complaint, the complaint data will, in the system will only be accessible to the complainant who submitted the original complaint. Name and email address information will need to be required and or will need to be required and submitted with complaints in order to be accessible through the system. Uh, to access the data, first the complainant will enter the complaint number they are interested in in checking the status of. Next, they will be required to confirm the email address that is associated with that complaint and solve a CAPTCHA challenge to prevent automated brute force attacks. If confirmed, the user will attest that they are the complainant associated with the complaint and, the individual, and an individual use access code and link will be sent via email to the address associated with the complaint. That individual use access code will be valid for a single use and will expire after two minutes. Regarding the information available, uh, which has been one of the harder things to work out in the system, uh, the general complaint information displayed will include the date the complaint was received, an open and closed status indicator, the respondent's name and license information with a link to their DCA search profile, the complainant's name, mailing address, email address, and phone number, summary information for the complaint if submitted online, and select complaint activity details. So to go further into what uh, the complaint activity details are available, and this was where I didn't want to just read off a whole long list of different activities, so I'm hoping Everyone can read that font there. I'd like it to be bigger. Um, but one of the first groupings of complaint activities that we have is, is the units grouping. And throughout the complaint review process, uh, complaints move through various sections of the Medical Board of California Enforcement Units and the Division of Investigation Health Quality Investigative Unit. These activities will help to identify the stage of the complaint review process the complaint is currently in and will show the prior stages that have occurred in the process. Some of these activities can occur multiple times as a complaint is reassigned between analysts or investigators in the same unit. So picture for these that have kind of a start and end, you literally will see the activity with the start date. If it hasn't ended yet, end date size, no blank, and then eventually it gets filled in there. Um, we'll have activities that have both a start and an end date, and then some that also have just a point in time, like this one thing happened this one day. Uh, the next section of complaint activities uh, are requests. So at any stage of the complaint review process, requests for information, including but not limited to medical releases, interviews, death certificates, can be requested from the complainant, the respondent, prior or subsequent providers, or a coroner. These activities will indicate when requests are made and when the responses are received. Depending on the number of involved parties, there can be multiple of each types of these requests listed on a complaint. If multiple requests are made to a particular involved party, one request may indicate that a response was received, while the other requests remain open until they're all completed. 
Now the next complaint activity section, disposition. These activities relate to the final stages of the complaint review process when an analyst reviews and or when analyst review and investigation steps have been completed and decisions are made whether to move forward with an accusation, whether to refer to the site and, and the complaint to the site and find unit, or whether to close the complaint without further action. If the decision to move forward with an accusation is made, information about when the matter is referred to the Office of the Attorney General and if the complaint is accepted or declined, and subsequently if the board files an accusation or petition to revoke probation. Uh, there's also a section about closures, and, and so this list is uh, a little small, and there's hopefully still legible. Um, finally, all complaints end in closure with various outcomes associated with the date. There are many different closure codes within the Breeze system. Those common are listed here, but there are additional closure codes not listed in this presentation. So if a complaint is closed for any reason, it'll, it'll be listed there with the reason along with the date uh, that that closure occurred. And then there's also another bullet there about the reopening complaint. For any reason a complaint is reopened, that date would also be listed there as well. So progress rise, uh, where we're at right now, the programming team has completed a proof of concept work on the web services, uh, confirming that a contractor is not needed in order to create the interfaces to pull the data out of Breeze in real time. So that was uh, a big hurdle that we completed uh, since the last uh, board meeting. And since then, we have been reviewing uh, all relevant complaint data activity codes. Uh, there's a lot of activity codes in Breeze, and they all have different dispositions with them. There's literally thousands of combinations of codes that we've gone through painstakingly to, to find the ones that were relevant for the complaint. Um, and we reviewed those with enforcement and legal staff. Uh, and, and so this has where we've gotten to this list that we're showing you guys today. Uh, reviewing uh, the translated description language continues and should be finalized within the coming weeks. So basically those bullet lists that are shown there, not only will they have that short description, there will also be, think of it like a tool tip, you click on it, it opens up, shows you more detailed information. We also plan on having links out to that complaint review process and other resources on our website to help clarify what's happening. Um, instead of repeating all the information over again in, in, in this system, you're taking them out where they can find those resources. Um, going forward with the uh, board members checkpoint approval of the framework presented today, the previously mentioned stage one business anal analysis can be created and submitted to the Department of Consumer Affairs and eventually the California Department of Technology for approval to proceed with the project. Additional stages may be required per the statewide information management manual Information Management Manual Section 19, Project Approval Lifecycle Framework, but we hope that we are, uh, we, hope, we are hopeful that since we believe the system can be created and maintained in-house using existing resources, we have a green light to proceed by the end of 2022. Optimal timelines with all the approvals being received before quarter four of 2022 could allow for development and testing of a first release to be ready sometime around mid-2023. In, in working on the requirements with, with this, we have been um, just coming up with the basic needs, what we call the minimum viable product to get something out that will be useful for consumers. Um, but, you know, we're thinking of all these other great ideas that would take more time, but will add more value to the system. Uh, one of the things we'd like to do shortly after the first release would be to add an automated mechanism to send the complaint number information to complainants as soon as the complaint is initiated to let them know this service is available. Um, right now they would rely on the paper letters that go out to give them their complaint tracking number. That would be how they would get back into the system. When you submit a complaint online in Breeze, unfortunately it doesn't tell you what the complaint number is at that stage. You have to wait for that letter. Um, sending that email out automatically is, doesn't sound like it's a big thing, but setting up a process to do that automatically in the scope of also building the system would be another extension of our resources that we have with our programming team. So we'd like to get the system up, then attack that. Uh, making electronic copies of the initial complaint form submitted on paper complaints, and then also electronic copies of any letters generated and sent to the complainant would also be a nice service to have. It's not stored in Breeze the rest of the, the way the rest of the other complaint data is, so additional web uh, services will be needed to pull those PDFs and electronic documents out. Uh, we'd like to also make that available to the complainant through there. 
And then finally, adding a two-way communication and file upload capabilities. Uh, that way, if a complainant wanted to send a message to the analyst or the investigator, they type it in there, it automatically get logged into a you know a notes field or something in, in the Breeze system. So we have that back and forth. And then if a release form or something was available where we could send that out electronically and have them upload it back up through the portal, automatically attach it in Breeze, save our analyst investigators some time manually connecting those things up in the system. Um, so again, these enhancements are being kept in mind during the planning of this mineral viable project to allow for these enhancements to be made at a later time uh, with less impact to the system. You know, if we can put something in there now, it makes it easier later. We don't have to do, you know, two things later on down the road. That's what we're trying to do at this point, so. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you again for having me today to update you on the complaint tracking system. Uh, I know Bill has a couple other points and we're gonna, I'm gonna get back over to my hosting spot over there, but if you have any questions at the end of Bill's update, I'm happy to answer the technical ones and I'll ask Carrie and Jenna to help me out on any other ones. So, thank you very much. Okay. okay, Sean, thank you very much. I'd now like to go on to the enforcement uh, report and then the licensing report very briefly. Uh, a lot of work has been done in terms of accurate billing uh, as we go to a cost recovery system and that is reflected in the report. One issue of particular significance to us are, are cases and investigation that are nearing the statute of limitations. Uh, we are working constantly with our uh, colleagues in the Attorney General's Office and HQIU to manage these cases as effectively as possible. And the fact we're coming up to time limits indicates, again, the importance of all of our legislative proposals so that the board can operate as effectively and efficiently as possible. Uh, the heart of our enforcement program, as is recognized by board members, by the Attorney General's Office, by our uh, Health Quality Investigators Unit is the role of experts. And again, we've been doing a lot of work and that is a source of continuous uh, uh, search for improvement as is set out in the report. Uh, it takes many different forms. Training is absolutely important as we have attempted to set out there is the amount of review that we have of all of the expert reports, the feedback that we get, the experience. It is not simply a matter of sort of experts being uh, summarily uh, fired. What happens is if we have an expert and the report is not up to standard, it certainly is something that we that is of great concern to us, but it's not the case that a expert can simply be dismissed. This may be an expert who is also the expert of record on other cases. So we have intensive engagements with the experts. We are constantly looking to improve the experts. We are constantly determining that there are some experts who will not be used in some cases or will not be used in other cases. And from speaking to our uh, staff, uh, there is a continuous uh, renewal of the, expert to, uh, of the expert pool on the order of about 10% per quarter. So there are always experts dropping off, experts that are coming back on. We are very active in recruiting new experts, constantly looking for them, reaching out to our stakeholders there. Uh, and it goes to the very heart of our ability to adequately uh, police the Medical Practitioners Act. And so we, we've set out everything that we're doing there. Uh, it's something that we're actively working on and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you would have there. Again, the expert reviewing program, we have over 600 uh, active experts in our database and we're constantly looking particularly on certain specialized areas and the, we're going through the various units. Uh, I simply want to note that the average days to initiate a complaint in the central complaint unit is now five days, which is much lower than it's been in the past. Um, but also of concern in the central complaints unit is that we have a number of vacancies there which are very significant and it does impinge our work and so it's a matter of 
constant a concern. What I would like to do is to go through a couple of the charts in the enforcement side uh, to highlight some of the uh, improvements that have taken place. If we go to, in terms of agenda item 8B9, I know this is a chart which uh, some members have been concerned about, the average days to complete investigations in the Complaints Investigations Office. Uh, during the first part of uh, uh, 2021, there was a significant increase in those timelines, and we had determined that the reason for this is that we had a number of subpoena enforcement cases, which were causing us to have to litigate the cases. It was very difficult to get records, uh, and so we have been successfully unwinding those cases, and so the timelines have come down there as we had hoped that they would. Another uh, particular development I would like to point out is in our pending enforcement caseload summary, and that's 8B14, uh, to note that uh, in contradiction to other uh, uh, caseload summaries that we've done in the past, in the past period, in the past quarter, the number of cases in the system has increased by 6%. Uh, and just to say that this is something that we had been anticipating for some time. We had, people will note that during COVID, there was a reduction in the number of complaints. Uh, for reasons, I think, which are easy enough to understand. There was a reduction in lots of different kinds of medical activities. It had long been anticipated that as we return to a more normal practice of medicine, there would be more interactions uh, and there would be more, uh, I mean, if there are more patient-physician interactions, we could expect an increase in the number of complaints. In particular here, the reason for the caseload increase by 6% is that we have a significant increase of complaints coming into the central complaint unit. So that's at the first stage of the process. So here we see two things happening. One, more cases coming into the system. And number two, we currently have a complaint, uh, central complaint unit where we have a vacancy rate approaching 20%. So it's the confluence of those factors which has, uh, which has given us a 6% increase of the total number of cases in the system. What I want to indicate to you is just a couple of things. Number one, this is something we had expected. Number two, we have to work on filling those vacancies and to operate as efficiently as possible. What we don't want to see is a return to an ever-increasing number of cases, which would indicate some kind of a backlog. So we have identified the problem, and we will consistently track that. The only way to deal effectively with complaints is to manage them, is to triage them, to ensure that each complaint gets the proper amount of attention at the right time. Some percentage of cases can be dealt with summarily. Others require considerable resources. So it's working them, managing them actively and effectively at all stages as they work through the process. What we don't want to see is this bulge initially getting larger and larger. So just to say we've identified the problem, and we will very carefully monitor the problem and to ensure that it's something that we can effectively manage. Moving on to the last report, very briefly, which is in licensing, and there the situation, again, is quite predictable. We're entering into the very busy season in terms of licensing. In the last quarter, the uh, numbers of license applications have increased by 177%. Uh, what I can say is that the team is working smarter, working more effectively. 
We've made a lot of progress going to a paperless application, and we can say that the timelines have remained within exceptional, within acceptable limits, but again, we have to monitor these things very carefully. But again, this is our very busy time. To move on briefly to the Mexico pilot project, just to give you an update there, we have issued 16 licenses. As we state there in the report, which was done at the end of April, that there are of the 16 license, there are two at that time who are practicing at their designated clinics. I can report that as of today, that number is up to 10. Once they're licensed, they have to be credentialed by a variety of different bodies before they can actually see patients. So we're now at the point that almost half of the uh, licensees are actually working in the clinic. So we're getting to the point after uh, a very long delay that the Mexico pilot project is coming into its own. So with all of that, we'd be happy to answer questions. And I know Sean and the team would also be happy to answer questions about the complaint tracking process. Thank you, Mr. Pasifka. Are there any questions or comments from the members? Dr. Gananadev. <clears throat> yeah, Mr. The, the Mexico pilot project, uh, I'm just curious, what's the, the quality of care measures we're taking? Remember, these, were, these people were not trained in the U.S. This, is, this was some political issue we, well, we, we had to do, but I just want to make sure that the same standard of quality of care are applied so that uh, the people they're treating don't suffer. Well, it is very, all the requirements of the project are exhaustively set out in legislation that I think was enacted over 20 years ago. They are working in these clinics, uh, which have been uh, affiliated with uh, uh, other programs. Uh, perhaps Ms. Webb could uh, briefly indicate the, uh, uh, the process under which the quality of care is assured. Sure, happy to. Uh, they have to meet strict standards as far as being board certified in Mexico that uh, meets the equivalence of board certification in the U.S. They have to undergo a six-month orientation program in Mexico. That program was approved by this board. Uh, then they have to uh, be interviewed and assigned to a clinic here that has to meet quality assurance requirements by the Joint Commission and uh, or the equivalent protocols that have been submitted to the board. So before a clinic can be approved, they have to meet certain qualifications to be able to, to have these licensees. Um, they have to meet um, English as a second language standards, taking courses in Mexico as well as here in the U.S. And they have to undergo a six-month externship with UCSF once they are here and practicing. Um, additionally, uh, UC Davis is conducting a, a study to be able to do reports to the board and the legislature about how effective these measures are in um, providing appropriate care to patients and, and patient satisfaction. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, I mean, the equivalency of board is, Kari, uh, it's not totally accurate because the only boards which are equal to U.S. boards are Canadian boards. Nobody else is similar. They are similar boards but not equivalent boards. So I, what makes me somewhat less concerned is the, what you mentioned about the six months of externship they need to do at UCSF or maybe UC Davis. That may bring them up to the to the U.S. standard, so that's what that's what my concern was. That is, are we going to have these people take care of 
for medical patients when we uh, when there are issues and they are not trained in the US thank you additional questions or comments from board members uh, Dr. Helder. Uh, I have a question for Sean um, regarding the timeline for implementing the uh, complaint tracking system. You had mentioned that the first release will be in mid-2023. Is that when the system will be ready for queries by consumers? I'm back in the WebEx, so I hope you can hear me okay this way. But um, yes, that, that if we got all the approvals by the end of this year, we figure about uh, three to four months development time and then two months of testing and, and things like that, which we'd be checking the complaints, making sure it's showing what we're expecting it to show with a release, yeah, mid-2023 to complainants. And they could, if they had complaints in the Breeze system already, they could access those complaints already in progress. You know, it won't be like a point forward thing. It'd be anything open and going forward from there. Thank you. And but that is with... <laughs> Uh, this we do have to submit this project plan, get it approved by the California Department of Technology for and have them tell us if we need to do more of these oversight steps or if we're just free to start development right then and there. So that I mean that's optimal timelines, but I think we've shown that we can do it in house and so it's not like some ten million dollar project that we need you know a lot of oversight on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. So, Sean, I think you, uh, Sean, first, uh, thank you for putting this together. I mean, this is one of the um, items that the public's been asking for, and I think it's something that's needed. I think it's going to be something really that will put us into the 21st century when it comes to technology. Uh, but my question is, is there a reason why we're trying to develop this in-house versus going out to the, a software company that has similar products? Um, I have a programming team and I like to make things custom when I can because I think it ends up in a in more of what you actually want. You know, there are certain situations where off the shelf product works great and other times when it doesn't. And and something where we have to go grab something out of an off the shelf system like Breeze, filter it to what we want to show the complainant, control their access through uh authentication routine and and get that all to work together finding something off the shelf from a software company that's going to do that would be you'd be paying them to custom develop for you or i can use the team that i have in house which is my preference so that i mean i think with the procurement the way the state does it and stuff like that and i haven't been involved in any large scale uh projects going out there and, and bidding on projects but it would it would take even longer probably be more expensive and, you know, just delay what we're trying to do. But, I mean, that's something we could explore further if that's really what you guys want. To do. Yeah, I think that might be something you might want to explore. Um, you know, my, uh, you know, history of working with government, and it's been a good history, don't get me wrong. Um, but, you know, when you're dealing with software and trying to, you know, figure out the UI, UX in it and, and how the different coding you're you know, dragging from multiple different systems, you know, having that consultant to tell you what you don't know, I'm sure your team is fantastic and great. Uh, I'm not disparaging that, but it might be something you might seriously want to look into because um, it's highly important. Um, you're going to find things that you didn't know, you're going to find problems that you didn't know you had before that could have been solved early on. It might save some of that time. So I will highly encourage you to go outside and just get a consultant to sit down. They'll just sit down and talk to you for free <laughs> uh, and tell them what you're trying to build. And they might be able to tell you uh, some of the things we don't already, some of the things we might be missing or some things you could enhance on what you already have. So this is my suggestion. Thank you. Dr. Stein. Yeah, um, this may be a moot point, but um, I'm sure the system's HIPAA compliant, right? Because for all the data that you would uh, want to get from physicians to upload certificates, PHI, uh, it has to be HIPAA compliant before I can release it to the system. So just want to make sure you're on top of that. So at least in the first release, none of that would be available through the system. We were talking about our complaints. Um, 
forms that we have where we're saying you sign this authorization so that we can go out and get your medical records. Medical records themselves will never be available through the system. Uh, so HIPAA requirements don't really fall in there. Uh, of course, the confidentiality of a complaint and who the complaint is and who the respondent is while it's still in the investigative phases, that's important to us. Um, but it's not HIPAA level, you know, concerning. Uh, you know, everything we put on the web has to be ADA compliant, things like that, but that's about the highest level of, uh, you know, compliance that we have to worry about. Nothing HIPAA related, anything like that. Uh, so the, the, the main trick is going to be how do we keep the system secure that the complainant themselves can access the system and prevent any unauthorized access. So we'll be doing that by requiring that email address when a complaint is submitted, sending those one-time use access codes, and preventing any brute force attacks from someone trying to get access to any of that complaint data. It'd be very hard, if not possible, for someone to brute force their way in with the level of protections that we have in there. So, uh, but again, no medical records, nothing like that in there. It's, it's a system that if we could send out a letter every time we updated a complaint, it would uh, just be all available in one electronic interface for someone to follow that way. So, hope that helps. All right, I think I've covered everyone to my left. I'll look to my right, Ms. Luviano. Can you hear me okay? Hello? Oh, Sean, you're very popular right now. My questions are for you as well. Um, the, Building off Mr. Brooks' comment. Oh, how's that? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Oh, there we go. Um, building off Mr. Brooks' comment, I understand. You know that interplay of time and money, right? Sure. If we have the money and someone else can build it faster, great. There's those advantages. However, I understand also that when we go outside to have something built. There's also issues of support and maintenance and bugs, you know, having someone else built it. And do we have the in-house capability to address those if and when they come up? Um, but I, I take it that staff is looking at which option is the best. You know, if it's a combination of outside and internal parties to make it happen, um, fine. I, I, I don't know, but I trust that we're looking at all those options. My questions were, um, on the back end capabilities of the system. Um, one from a tracking standpoint and a notification. So I'm curious with respect to the notification side, as these cases are in the system, is there a notification going internally that flags our side that says, hey, you know, this case is in the red. This case is already, you know, X number of days out. So I'm wondering if it has that kind of notification capability in terms of you know, that's very efficient to electronically tell us, you know, as things are moving through the timeline. And then second, from a, from a data standpoint, the data that's collected in the system, are we able to extract that for, you know, tracking and data analytics purposes on all of the data that's in there? Yeah, so let me try to answer both of those at once if I can. So the data itself is stored in the Breeze system. I've heard I'm sure you guys have heard that thrown around. You probably haven't seen internally like we deal with it every day, but the Department of Consumer Affairs maintains the breed system, and there's a reporting system uh, on the IBM Cogno side that we can data warehouse that data, build reports. So your, your first point of would the complaint tracking system provide any sort of updates internally? No. Uh, the complaint tracking system is for complainants. You know, I mean, we will have data and logging to know how effectively it's being used and things like that. The kind of situation where you know if something's in the red, what we would do is the enforcement asks us all the time, we, hey, we need a report that tells us X, Y, and Z, you know, older than so many days. And, and we build the report in the system and can schedule that and they get that report every Thursday morning at 6 a.m. or however they want it. So we have that capability already to set up automated reporting and, and uh, you know, not necessarily flagging, but listings of, here's something you might want to take a look at. You know, we just rely on them to tell us what they want to look at, and we, we build those reports to do that. And so the, 
your second point, so yes, we do have that data warehousing capability and the reporting systems to support it and stuff. Um, we, you know, we building those reports all day, every day. We have one, one position dedicated just solely just building reports for licensing enforcement. They're constantly doing that stuff all day. So Great. Thank you. The uh, other thing I wanted to touch on was the, was the, uh, the wallet card, the print your own wallet card at home. So it, it's solution we, we launched uh, beginning of the year, April. It was, you know, fully launched where now we don't generate any plastic cards at all. But the, the model of that, the process of that is a licensee authenticates themselves. We go into Breeze, we authenticate them based on their personal identifying information. Then we call a web service that gets information about their license out of Breeze, formats it on a page, and then they print it out, print it out home and cut it and, you know, put it in their license. The complaint tracking system, very similar process, right? It's just instead of a licensee, it's a complainant. And instead of pulling license information, it's pulling complaint data. So the, the framework's there, it's just, you know, building all the pieces in there to get it in there. So it's something I feel confident we can do in-house, but we can certainly, you know, see what's out there too. Thank you. Mr. Rue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Preska, um, while we're on this topic, can you remind me again our current protocols, once uh, 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 enforcement is resolved, uh, do we notify the um, uh, the uh, complainant? It, 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 I'm, it's, I'm responding to the two um, public callers who are asking about that. You ask Jenna Jones, we'll give you a chapter and verse on that. Um. Yes, sir, we do. We do send letters. So I heard the comment. I'm going to go back and check into that tomorrow because I, I don't know if an address was changed or um, I, I, I don't have an answer for that, but I'll have to find out. So obviously while we're waiting for this new technological system, that sounds great. Um, so besides sending a letter, do we have, is there any other notification? Is there something on, online that people could check up on right now or what other? If a disciplinary action is taken, it's posted on our website for that doctor. Uh -huh. If there is no disciplinary action? Um, there is not. So it's only the letter notification for the complainant or the person, the victim? Um, the letter goes to the complainant, yes. And if yeah. a disciplinary action is taken, it's posted on the public website. And if there is not none, the letter, the disciplinary action right. itself, I'm sorry. Right. And if there's no disciplinary action, there, it's only the letter that gets notified to the uh, complainant. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Additional comments or questions, Dr. Hagen? Uh, thank you. I apologize, Sean, if you mentioned this, I had to step out. So it reminds me of what happens with uh, my patients when we did virtual visits. Um, some people said, yeah, I'll do a virtual, we go on the computer, we can do it, and they weren't able to. And then they had a younger relative there, someone maybe in their 30s, and they still couldn't do it. And we have some experience with um, our app. My question is, are we looking at the ability of the individuals to use this device? Say, we, a lot of folks have, tele, have phones, smartphones. Some of my old patients just have flip phones, which are not smart. Many of them don't use computers. I don't know if these are the people that are gonna be making complaints, but have you thought about the requirement for folks who need to be able to access this information? Thinking about individuals who may be older, visual problems, arthritis problems, et cetera. Yeah, we think about it every day, you know, and develop it on the website and things like that. We have to be ADA compliant, compliant on everything nowadays. It's almost like mobile first is what you think of first anymore. And, and then if it works on a phone, it's going to work on a computer, right? And we always try to stick with a very uh, simple user interface, you know, to make it there. But we, we know from the support we provide to our licensees and everyone, you have always varying levels of technological capabilities, right? And you, you try to build that system so that you get a high percentage of people that can use it intuitively, but there's always going to be, you know, some people that have trouble with it, you know, it's, it's something never 100%, you know, for everybody kind of a thing like that. But uh, yeah, definitely, we will, we will build it, you know, that mobile first. Um, you know, as we talk about the process with the complaints, it's, yeah, it can be, you know, weeks, months, before you're, you're getting these letters and things like that, and that's with, you know, no delivery problems and people having addresses correctly in the system and all kinds of stuff. Um, 
even in this, in this system, it's, it's going to be something that, yeah, people can check it every day. They can check it in the middle of the night whenever it's convenient for them, but they still might not see an update every day. You know, it's, it's when data is entered into the system and things are happening that's getting in there, but it's certainly going to be more frequent updates than when they get that letter. And then, like, right when we generate that letter in the system and, and you know, print it out on the printer, that information will be logged into Breeze already at that point and you know, immediately available through this complaint tracking system. That letter has to get folded up, stuffed in an envelope, ran through a postage machine, go through BSO, get out to the post office, get in the mail, get to the recipient, which takes, you know, days to week, you know, to a week, their stuff too. So the goal is, is like cutting that time out and getting every little update that, uh, you know, that, that we've identified here that doesn't trigger a letter either because a lot of those things listed in those bullets aren't letter things. You know, they're, they're, Jenna can go into more detail about all the letters that we send out, but there's, you know, we can't send out 50 letters, you know, uh, for each different little thing like we can in this system because it's just somebody viewing something on a screen. So. Uh, Mr. Watkins, it's all your hand. Well, thank you, Bill, and thank you to the staff for doing this, especially the enforcement staff who and HQIU for doing all the investigation stuff. My question is always related to enforcement and money. Love money. So the first part of the question is, I see that there's 1.1 months in reserve for the end of 21-22. That's next month, right, Bill? If that is correct, next month? We're talking about the fund condition. The fund condition. Yeah, we've run out of road. Oh, that, I just wanted to. That's em- why we're getting the ten million. Yes, I, and I just wanted to emphasize that we are there at the end of the road of the money that a previous loan. So that will have we have to deal with that down the road. My next question is with regard to, you know, enforcement, and what struck me, you know, and thank you, Sean, for putting that presentation together because it highlights something else for me. I just wanted to know, where's the bottleneck in this system? We are now seeing a a slight increase, 6% increase in the amount of complaints. And I just want to kind of get us an understanding. How many medical consultants do we have? How many medical consultants? Consultants, yeah. I think, well, in the report it says, what, 624. Oh, not the reviewers, like in-house, sorry, in a, the in-house medical consultant or medical expert. Okay, Jenna. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. The uh, medical consultant I think you're talking about is on the front end? or, or the Yes, yes, that's what I'm talking CCU? about. Okay. Um, we have a panel of medical consultants. We do have medical people that serve as experts and medical consultants. I don't have the specific number off the top of my head of the number of medical consultants, but we have them across all the modalities as well. Um, so I can get that number and get back to you if that's okay. No, no that's not it. I, I'm, I'm looking for where's the bottleneck in the system where things are just like coming to a dead halt in the system that increases the timelines and do all of the, and this could create the frustration in the system. And I thought that, you know, it could be just that it, 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 it goes to a certain point and that's where the, the sticky point is. That's what I'm asking. In the process, going from CCU to the medical consultant, from the CCU after the medical consultant has made, uh, given some advice to then refer to investi- investigation. I'm just trying to understand, and it's important because if we kind of, I'm trying to analyze the system and try to understand, like, through the whole system, does it all work effectively and efficiently up to a point? And what is that point? Is that when we hand it over to the AG's office and then all the legalities begin, or does it begin before that? Well, um so the first time frame is getting the case in and initiated. And as Mr. Persifka reported yeah, earlier, we we're down around five days. Um, then the case goes to CCU unless it's immediately kicked out to HQIU. Right. Um, 
their time frame is down. I'd have to look at the exact sum number. I'm sorry, I don't have that off the top of my head, but it's one of the numbers. It's down. I believe it was in the 90s or lower or 70s. Forgive me, I, I don't have that off the top of my head. Yeah. And then the case goes to HQIU, or um, it may be in our internal group with CIO. Um, and, and I will say that's where the bulk of the upfront time is uh, involved. Thank you. Um, so you've got the complaint time frame in CCU at this last quarter, it was 97 days. Right. Um, that's down uh, significantly from what it was the last two or three years. Um, and then we get to the CIO timeframes and the HQIU timeframes. And that's where we're, we're talking about the statute situation, right. where we're bumping up, up into that three year from receipt of the complaint, unless it falls into one of the other statutes. But let's, generally, let's just stick with the three years. Um, we're seeing a significant number of cases that are uh, very close to that statute of limitations. And in that time frame, we're getting the cases to the AG's office and sometimes within weeks, sometimes within a month or two months. Um, but it, that puts a, a strain on the system. Um, oh. And unfortunately, that's been what we've been experiencing. And I'm hoping we're trying to work through and reduce that. Um, and seeing the numbers come down, uh, CIO is working aggressively on that. I know HQIU is trying to address that issue as well. But I, I think that's where the bulk of the time comes in is the investigation process. So do you suggest we need more investigators, a whole, a, more, a, a greater army, but for that we'll need money? Um, I think we need to evaluate the process, um, look at the, the gaps in time uh, for some of the cases, and you know just have a, a better understanding of keeping the cases moving. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Ruscher, go ahead. If I could just follow up there. I think um, if I could uh, jump in with what TJ was saying. Uh, the question is, um, is there, what can we do to help you? I mean, is there more staff, HPIU staff, or which, it, it, maybe it's not staff. I know you just said that you want to analyze a little bit further, but what is it that you need to possibly reduce all these times? Is it just, is it just lack of staff or something else? Um, well, I think we've put some proposals forward legislatively that may cut the time frames. that would be, huge time savers. Um, I believe right now we're dealing with a vacancy issue. Um, so that kind of slows down the internal process. Um, HQIU has worked hard on bringing down the actual pending number of complaints significantly over what they've had for previous years. Um, but we still got to catch up with the backlog. So at this point, um, we've got to get the vacancies filled first. Vacancies and staff. Yes, sir. No. Both at um, medical board internally and HQIU. Yeah, yeah, and I do want to acknowledge from the last two, this meeting and last meeting, those numbers have come down considerably. So great job on your part. But let us know. I think the entire board wants to help um, the, the, the staff. Um, so whatever other ideas or whatever you find in your data sets that we can do to um, help you. Um, I know vacancy is just a problem just everywhere, right? Even in restaurants, I mean, you name it. So that's, that's something that we can't, there's nothing we, we could do about. But if there's something else, right, just let us know so we could try to uh, help lobby for you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any additional comments? Toucher. Yeah, I have a, a quick question to tag on to the uh, print, um, print at home cards. Is it going to be a part of the app too? So this way you can see it. On your smartphone? That's a uh, second release phase to have Apple Wallet passes and Google Pay passes to it and stuff. But as legislature, I mean, we have a finite programming team, but yeah, that's something okay. we want to add to it. Thank you. Uh, just before we move to public comments, <clears throat> just a couple of comments my, uh, myself. Um, a lot of the, well, as part of our suite of legislative proposals, there were a number of proposals that were targeted at 
making this enforcement process more efficient and more effective. And frankly, we need the legislature's help, right? Uh, we can tell the legislature exactly what we need, but then we need them to take it up and actually do something about it. And that actually goes to our fund condition as well. We told the legislature exactly what we needed last year, and they gave us a fraction of it, right? Now, we have to live with what the legislature uh, does there, um, but all of us should be on board to be talking to our own legislators, um, to be working, of course, through Aaron, who's doing just terrific work, but to continue to emphasize the point to the legislature, who really has the fate of this board and our ability to effectively serve the public in its hands, we need their help, and we need to continue to tell them that we need their help. We need adequate resources. We need to be funded appropriately um, so that we can both fill the positions and advance our mission. So I would just encourage all of us, you know, talk to Aaron, um, you know, about what you can do and, and any support that you can provide to him in terms of communicating with the legislature. It's been a huge focus of mine for the past six months, really, as we released our initial you know, suite of proposals, uh, and then I've spent a lot of time talking to the legislature about it. But frankly, we don't have a bill right now. We don't have a vehicle that says we're going to get the money we need, right? Um, it may be that that comes next year. It may be that there's um, some, some vehicle for it to happen before the end of this legislative cycle this year. But there's nothing in print right now that gives us the money we need to fund this agency. Uh, and frankly, that's on the legislature. We can, all, all we can do is ask them, and if they're listening, we're asking you uh, to please help us out. So with that, um, let's move on to public comments. Are there any comments uh, from those in the room? All right, seeing none, Shauna, let's go to the WebEx, please. Okay, and those who would like to make a public comment? Please use the raising hand feature in WebEx or type something in the Q&A and any call-in users can press star three to raise your hand. First up, we have uh, Brianna Pell. Brianna, you should be getting that request on your end. Hi, this is Brianna Paley and the question regarding my address. My address never changed and I also have called the medical board several times to ensure that you guys had the correct contact information. Um, my other question or comment is, I, you guys mentioned that you triage um, medical board complaints, and I find that hard to believe. Um, Dr. Yang has had three complaints against him, two happening from 2016 incident, and the third being a 2020 incident. All three were, have been substantiated. One loss of life from my father, and the other two were seriously injured in surgery, and he is still practicing with all he, all he received as a public reprimand, and I filed my complaint in January of 2018, and I did not receive, well, I haven't received the response, but I saw online that he received his public, public reprimand in February of 2022, which is four years and seems absurd for a doctor who's had three incidents and three complaints in less than five years, in, in three years, really. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Marion Hollingsworth. Marion, you should begin that request on your end. Hello, can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marion Hollingsworth. Regarding the complaint liaison unit, why would you have to check with other boards to see what they are doing first? Uh, don't be afraid to be coming up with your own idea. Uh, couldn't you just go ahead and come up with your own unit without checking with other, with other states? Uh, but Primarily, you should be checking with advocates or other complainants who have gone through your system to see what would help them. My complaint took three years and two months before a discipline was posted. I was promised an accusation, but you settled on a public letter of reprimand behind my back, and only after that was I informed of this decision. I didn't even see it until it went up online. I know other cases that took more than four years. We complainants and advocates could give you insight on what we wish we had known while going through the process and how you can change your process to keep us informed. Again, as I said earlier in this meeting, listen to us. Don't go to other boards or the CMA to find out what complainants want to know. We know but the process better than they do because we have experienced it firsthand. Don't pretend you know how we feel because I guarantee you don't. 
Please talk to us before you report in August on this proposed complainant liaison. And regarding this online complaint process, any notification of an update in a complaint is welcome. I was wondering if the board phone app could be possibly linked to that so the complainant could get a notification on there as well, as well as using the uh, email. That would be extremely helpful. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, up next here we have Eric Anders. Eric should be receiving that prompt on your. First, it's always good to hear uh, time frames shortened, but people never ask how that happens. Is something now suffering because the time frames are less? Are more complaints being closed so as to get through complaints faster? That's the question you all need to be asking: is why the time frames are shorter? Are you skimping on something so that they become shorter? Ari, the complaint, uh, the complaint tracking system. It's once again like you've only been partially listening to us all these years. Um, we all know that the medical board app, which I believe was created in house is a dismal failure. It still doesn't work properly. We get app notices that something has changed on a doctor's profile and we can't begin to figure out what it is. So Lori Rose bugs are still an issue in house after all these years. Ryan, that was an excellent question about going outside of the in house team and I'm doing air quotes. Breeze still isn't completely ADA compliant. There's still fonts that we've been complaining about for years that are way too small for the visually impaired. I can understand some information being private to the complainant, but some of the basic complaint information needs to be available to the public. The fact that there is a complaint needs to be available to the public. This is information a patient needs when deciding whether to see a doctor or suspects that a current doctor is, has malfeasance. If the contractor state license board and other boards can show pending complaints with a disclaimer, the medical board can do it as well. Once the board decides on the possible charges to be filed, that needs to be made public. When I filed a contractor complaint, they very quickly triaged it and decided on possible infractions, and they were all listed on the website before an accusation was ever filed. This needs to be done by the medical board and all other DCBO, DCA boards for that fact. The public also needs to be able to monitor the timeline of when a complaint is filed and how long it's taking to move through the system. We need to have that oversight of this board because you all are failing. You're failing and you're trying to pull the wool over our eyes. We need to see those timelines to see if you're shirking your duties. I realize some of this takes a change in the law, but since it already exists in the law for other boards, it shouldn't be a problem to get it for the medical board, unless of course the California Medical Association objects for their one third of California's doctors, which we know they will. Thank you. No comment. Next we have Virginia. Should be uh, seeing that request heading your way, Virginia. Oh, again. So um, regarding pending complaints, so actually the CMA sued the medical board in 1990 something for wanting to do pending complaints. So that's why it's different than the other boards is because of CMA. Regarding the funding, what was missed is the CMA lobbied, according to the website, against proper funding. So their members could pay up to like $600 a month to be a member of the CMA, but they can't afford to pay the CMA, I mean the medical board. Regarding the website, is there a thing to capture priority cap, um, cases such as death, non-licensed professionals doing surgery on people and such like that? Is there also um, ability to capture number of complaints? Like if an incident happens and there's 20 other complaints, will this system capture all those complaints or will be they be individual? And it was said the best way to deal with complaints is management. And I can't read the rest of my writing, but no, the best way to deal with complaints is preventing complaints from happening in the first place. So what are you guys doing to help prevent complaints? Because when I read the complaints, a lot of them are the same thing over and over and over and over. So how can we prevent them from happening in the first place? And are these new licensees being trained on patient safety, how to prevent errors, and how not to falsify records. 
And let me see if I can read any of my other writing I put here. Um, no, I can't. So, oh, the computer system should capture common problems. And so you can bring those common problems and that will save on your workload and your money and the trauma to the patient and the complications for the doctor. So once again, can you please have an agenda item for prevention? And you know, the CMA again is a cause of preventing compli complaints and the funding of the board. So please study the CMA role in patient safety. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Dr. Henry. Yes, hello here. Uh, Hannah with uh, Black Patients Matter. So uh, I think the app is a great idea. Uh, it's really going to serve a, a large number of, of folks. Uh, but uh, I hope you realize that very soon you're going to have to update it after you implement it because um, we're all headed to a, a adding an off ramp to this, this cycle of complaints and investigations and, and uh, revocation. We need an off ramp and that off ramp is going to be mediation. And so um, when you mentioned triaging, so Brianna, um, when they say triage, some cases take priority and it's not necessarily, as you know, the most serious one. I'm very sorry about the loss of your father. I'm, I'm very sorry about that. But please understand that um, triaging at the medical board involves um, the priority cases are ones that are in the news media. Okay. The second are going to be um, cases of retaliation. So for myself being a whistleblower, um, they pursued me all the way to the end and I was at the top of the list. I don't think anyone here, maybe one or two people here know this fact, but the HQIU and the um, investigative unit and the AG's office, they all use templates, templates. So I don't know why it's taking them such a long time to write these things up because they're using templates. So as we know, after I filed my federal civil rights lawsuit against uh, David Chris, the director of the HQIU, he stepped down from that department or retired or whatever else. And that's why we have Mr. Brass now. And as Mr. Prasivka once stated, there's a large amount of money that was unaccounted for within the HQIU. So because we, it's not logical <clears throat> to increase the fees of physicians um, to, you know, licensing fees up to what, $20,000 to get a medical license in the state of Florida, that will definitely cover um, what they need to uh, investigate. We need mediation. Mediation is what will allow um, resolution and closure for patients. That, will, would, that would have helped you, Brianna, to get your answers. And so um, there's a large discord between Prasivka and Ms. Um, Castro. Castro is on her way out. We're going to cut back on Castro's budget, and there's going to be mediation added Please because conclude. Castro wants to revoke, and Prasivka wants to heal the here. doctor patient relationship. Next up, we have Michelle Montserrat Ramos. Michelle, you should be getting that prompt on your end. Michelle, I think I can hear the background noise. I am Michelle Montserrat Ramos, and I'm with Consumer Watchdog. I assure you, Mr. Rue, my advocate moms and advocate families are not receiving letters. 
One of the high priority cases, even with that case, there was no case resolution letter or even a letter that an investigation was started. So the notification system is direly needed because the letters are not being sent out. Sean, I thank you for your work. I lost the sound and access to the meeting after Mr. Prasifka mentioned the board's loan. So I may have missed this, but for the second version of the complaint tracking system, please make sure that the tracking system is also available in Spanish and is something that the site impaired can access. One of my advocates lost her sight permanently during a biopsy. A surgeon erroneously cut fully through the superior vena cava, um, the main vein entering the heart, then surgeon it completely closed, cutting off blood flow. She's lost her sight permanently. She would need access to a tracking system just as much as Californians that enjoy their sight. Also in the tracking system, can you include when a complaint is with the medical consultant that it is on hold in a waiting pattern because the medical consultant is reviewing another case. Regarding the complaint lays on unit, we need the three steps of consumer input into the enforcement process included in the processes of the unit in order for this to work. If you included our three steps, we could possibly support it. The communication plan and the tracking system is something that we have been asking for and advocating for as a group. Please include us in the process as you proceed. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next, we have Christina Hildebrand. Let me send you. Oh, your name changed. Okay. Christina should be getting that prompt there. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Christine. Okay, great. So, a uh, couple of comments here. Um, number one, if I understand that the medical board is in desperate need of money. If you hadn't heard, Governor Newsom has a lot of it. Um, the budget committees are happening right now uh, as we speak. So, if you are not in touch with legislatures asking them to put money into the budget for the medical board, I would think that you would need to do that, and I recommend doing it. And I wouldn't go through the CMA for your doctors who are part of the CMA to do it. Hildebrand, we're having trouble hearing you. Did you hear what I just said? Or can you hear me now? Me? Sean, can you check in with her, please? Yeah, it's stuttering. A little bit, Christina. Um, if you've okay. walked away from your Wi-Fi or anything like that, I'd stay close. No, I'm, I'm, stay, I'm close to it. it. Sounds clear now, um, so yeah, why don't you try again? Okay, okay. So I'll start over. Um, my comment on money is I understand that the medical board needs money. Um, the governor has a lot of money, and right now they're going through, the legislators are going through the budget hearings, which if the medical board has not requested money through your legislators, and I would recommend the medical board members that are not part of the CMA, because the CMA doesn't want you to have any money, um, go talk to the legislators that are on these committees that are you know, working out where that wonderful surplus goes. Um, to Eric's question of where, how did the numbers or how did the days get cut down, what I heard was they had a number of uh, medical board accusations where they couldn't get the records and so therefore they had to subpoena the records and go through the legislative process. I can enlighten you on that. That's because of the vaccine medical exemptions. So the vaccine medical exemption cases are witch hunts. The, the people bringing those cases are not the patients. It is nurses from schools. It is Kaiser physicians who don't like medical exemptions and will not blanket, will not write medical exemptions that are ratting out other doctors and the medical board going after those doctors. And so, you know, my recommendation is let's go and investigate the ones that are actually brought by patients or their families rather than this whole misinformation troop that, you know, is trying to basically target doctors that are actually just doing their job. But you have to go after or you feel you have to go after for political reasons again. So, you know, it, it, let's focus on those pa patients and their families who are bringing bringing cases to the medical board themselves rather than third parties who are just trying to rat on other people that they don't like. I also appreciate for Virginia that brought it up. 
let's look at prevention. Let's look at stopping the number of complaints to the medical board, because clearly there are repeat offenders. Um, we've gone through the, the list of who's been who's been uh, who's been disciplined in the past. I don't know ever. Um, and the majority of them fall under Please two conclude. or three types Time's of up. form. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. This time, President Lawson, I don't see any additional requests of queue. All right. Thank you, Sean. Are there any uh, further comments from members? All right. Seeing none, we're going to move on to agenda item nine, which is update on revising guidelines for prescribing controlled substances for pain. Mr. Prasipka. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the executive and the task force has been working very diligently on this project since the date of the last board meeting. We have incorporated into draft guidelines extensive uh, information given from our subject matter experts as well. We have analyzed the recent updates from the CDC in uh, their own guidelines. The goal here is to address a number of issues which have been very well aired in this board. Uh, problems have arisen in relation to access. Uh, the issue of overprescribing is certainly not going away. Uh, the number of overdose deaths continues to accelerate, and it particularly is a problem with street drugs. So what we have done in the task, working with the task force, uh, the executive has produced a first draft of the revision of the guidelines. We have submitted it to the task force. They have given us direction on that, and we are now prepared to go to a public consultation with it. So what we intend to do in the very near future, really within a week or two, uh, we plan to release the guidelines, invite a public consultation. We'll be asking interested parties um, if they wish to submit written comments in advance of the meeting, which we can then post and share with everyone. We can then have a full public uh, consultation for all interested parties. Um, and then to use that to further refine them. Uh, I want to thank uh, the staff who have worked very, very diligently on this. I want to thank our two task force members who have given us substantial amounts of direction. And maybe I would ask uh, each of our task force members just to very briefly give their thoughts on our guidelines to date, Dr. Thorpe and Mr. Brooks. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Brooks. Uh, um, first, I just want to thank uh, you and your team and staff. Um, you know, when you're going through this process, it has to be well thought out and well reasoned. And I, I believe we followed those guidelines in that process. You know, every time we've gone and had our subcommittee meetings, it was the public, the community, safety uh, involved and centric. And that will make these guidelines a uh, better guidelines. And I, I have been very impressed with your team when it comes to public involvement. You know, let's get the draft together. Let's do the background. But these can these guidelines can't become permanent until we get you know quality input from the public, and that's why we're here. And so I want to say thank you for that, and also for the guidance of uh, Dr. Thorpe um, on these guidelines and our experts. You know, having uh, someone with the wisdom that he has on this has made this process. Uh, smoother and easier and better, and um, it will achieve the goal of what we're, tr what we're trying to achieve. So thank you very much. Those are my comments. Uh, thanks, Mr. Prasif. Can I, I really want to appreciate uh, Mr. Brooks' uh, uh, support during this whole time. It's been helpful in helping develop substantive processes to help address this um, this complex issue. Uh, it is important that we make sure that the, the issue of opioid excessive prescribing is still um, uh, kept in view and is not uh, abandoned as part of our concern. But I do believe that um, once the guidelines are, are released, that the, the public will find that they are a much more um, that they give much more uh, um, how should I say it much more uh, uh, um, flexibility in uh, dealing with uh, 
subsets of pain, specifically um, chronic pain and um, uh, um, oh, sorry, intractable pain. Thank you, Bill. Um, in that particular area, uh, I think there's a significant change in in language to allow the physician. Uh, with the appropriate documentation and with the appropriate processes in place to be able to prescribe um, in a way that is going to be effective for the patient. And I think that's what we're really trying to do here is to provide a, a, a document that will really um, keep patients safe and yet also uh, be able to have enough flexibility to deal with really um, out of the you know, the pain patients that don't fall into the normal guidelines. And uh, I'm very, I was very impressed with the staff. I really appreciate um, our subject matter expert, uh, Dr. Mackey, uh, who, who gave us great uh, insight and, and was uh, incredibly available in terms of time uh, that he gave to the project. So I, I think that the medical board, uh, I will be interested to see, but my, my sense is that the, this this new uh, uh, shift in the approach bring us a little bit back towards the center of medical practice is going to be received much more um, enthusiastically, and I think it will be received in with a very positive uh, in a very positive manner. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from board members? I see Dr. Hawkins and Dr. Granada next. Uh, thank you very much. One of my questions and comment has to do with helping providers who recognize that pain needs to be addressed, but are still extremely concerned about coming before the medical board. Now, as a doctor makes prescriptions, I mean, I do my complete medical workup, I order tests, uh, patients have contracts, you know, we, uh, we test them regularly, we check cures, we do all the things we're supposed to do, yet yeah, I'm still concern, but even though the documentation, my question is whether we're helping these physicians who just said, I'm not going to do it, tough luck, there's nothing you can do, and have limited resources to pain doctors or other doctors who are willing to do it and do it the right way. Are we helping them be able to do the type of documentation that's required so that folks can actually say the patient is not a victim of the fact that the, the doctor is just totally scared, even though they know what to do. They know how to do the workup. I know the test to order, I know all the things to do. Um, that's my question. Comment. Well, I mean, uh, the one thing which has become very clear to me during this entire process is that there's a very significant gulf, a gulf between the perception some in the profession have and what the medical board actually does. There is a concern out there that somehow we discipline doctors by algorithm that we've already determined for every class of patients the maximum level that you can prescribe. And if you are over that, uh, somehow it will come down on you like uh, a ton of bricks. Uh, as someone who signs every single accusation, I can say that that is not how we do things. With our partners, with our investigators, with the Attorney General's office, if we're bringing a case for misprescribing, it is brought very meticulously over a very thorough and complex set of criteria. It's really the failure to do any sort of a medical evaluation, the failure to treat the patient in the context in which they are. So a couple of answers to your questions. It's very clear to me that once we issue the guidelines and once we have them, we have a lot of outreach that we have to do in order to more thoroughly educate the profession on what we're doing. We hope that these guidelines in their ultimate form will really inform the profession that this is one area of practice, and I can speak on this as someone who is not a doctor, which is highly contextualized. And what has come forward to me is that the need for record keeping and to have a thorough rationale for what you're doing. But we are not here to play gotcha 
with the medical profession. It is our goal to issue guidelines which allows doctors to practice and to meet the needs of patients, many of whom face very complicated circumstances, many of whom have been on these, uh, the, these medication for years and require very specialized treatment. So what we need to do is to have guidelines that allows doctors to practice with the confidence that we're not going to simply uh, you know, descend upon them and play some kind of a game of gotcha, but to empower them to deal with patients, many of whom have very complicated problems. And I, I have to say we've been very fortunate. Uh, there's a lot of expertise in the state of California. Uh, Dr. Mackey, of course, has been our lead expert. We've had many other experts who have helped us deal with some very complicated cases. But, I mean, our work begins with these guidelines, and then we're going to have to go out there and to educate uh, the profession that, you know, if they practice medicine and they deal with these complicated uh, cases, um, that we're here to support what they do. Thank you very much, Bill, for that strong statement which I believe is, and know is true. Hi, Dr. Gimelandev. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Lawson. So um, as a, one of the culprits who came up with the guidelines, uh, before the CDC did, this medical board actually came up with the guidelines. But, Bill, I can tell you by, I think you know me what I do in life, so I come across a ton of doctors. They are truly afraid they are not prescribing the medications for people who need. I, that's why I think it's extremely important. Remember that it started as a prescription opioid issue. Right now, majority of deaths are from illegal fentanyl, which is coming straight through the southern border. Everybody complains, but nobody wants to control. And I saw how many thousands of pounds of fentanyl which came through every year for the past couple of years. So that's where we need to concentrate. But when it comes to pain, I have no doubt that our guidelines made doctors afraid enough not to prescribe appropriate pain, pain medications to, uh, to patients. So the, what I'm going to ask you is, after we come up with the guidelines, then they can write uh, electronically, they can write letters, but this may be an issue where we should have an open meeting where people can ca come and present and get, add to see how we can improve the guidelines so that way there is no doubt we do want to stop addiction to opioids and help people who are addicted to come off. But at the same time, we want people with chronic pain, not just cancer pain, chronic pain, not to suffer. Thank you. Ms. Luviano. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick question for the task force. When Dr. Mackey spoke to us, I remember him saying that this is an opportunity for California to lead the way and not just speed to you know, get guidelines in place. So I was curious from your work, what are those potential opportunities for us to lead the way? Um, I, so I think there's a couple of things that are very different about this set of guidelines that um, I found very reassuring and, and, and I think the, the medical profession and, and patients will be reassured by as well. It's very clearly outlined what is expected when somebody, it's very well defined what is chronic pain and intractable pain, and it's uh, pointed out what the evaluation and workup is recommended. One of the problems is that in, in the past has been that it's not been well, the, the, many people were trying to do the, all the things that needed to be done, but much of it because it's a lot of work to document everything that needs to be done. And unfortunately, a lot of it wasn't being documented 
So even people who, who got into trouble couldn't show that they had done what they, I mean, they thought they were doing it, but they weren't really, didn't have the documents to prove it. So the, the new guideline will clearly outline step by step what's expected in the record. And we'll point out that the, the issue is not the, the amount of morphine equivalents that you're using. It's going to be it's going to be dependent on your rationale for what the, the reason you need the chronic pain treatment, what your workup has been, and what your documentation of the process has been. So it, I think it's a, and and uh, as Bill has already pointed out the. The idea that we're not out here to just uh, trick you into getting into trouble. You know, the idea is we want to support you, and I do think it's going to take a significant amount of outreach um, on the part of medical board staff and maybe even members of the medical board to be able to actually advocate for this posture um, with physician groups um, across the state because I think it's going to take a significant amount of work to turn the tide back because of this fear that Dr. Hawkins already mentioned about, which I totally agree with, it's 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 and Dr. Gnadev as well. Yeah, and one of the things you know, that Dr. Gnadev said was so important and true, and it's kind of the big missing missing piece of this puzzle, is you know doctors in the profession get lumped in with the fentanyl problem that's happening nationwide. Right, and so trying to get a doctor to say you know here's best practice and they're reading in the paper someone overdosed on, on fentanyl or some other opioid that's out there, people are afraid. So it's gonna take education on a much higher level. Um, you know, I just read a, it was the Family for Intractable Pain Relief you know, by Chris Dogden. Good information in here, right? You know, I think the premise of the organization is you know, there are people who have chronic pain and how do we solve this challenge, right? But part of the, so the solution to that challenge is solving the perception of you know what we're trying to do and what we're trying to heal and that's going to probably be a larger topic than the guidelines that we're trying to create today so i don't know if that answers your question or not thank you additional comments all right seeing none uh, any comments in the room all right seeing none sean if you could open the webex please Yes, anyone who would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand or type something in the Q&A window. Uh, first up here, we have Eric Anders. Uh, what in the world? Bill, you should be fired for that statement. You are here to say gotcha to any doctor who has harmed or killed a patient or has broken the medical practice in any way. This is as bad as former board member Ron Lewis saying, well, we can't hang everybody. <clears throat> You can darn well hang every doctor that deserves it who has harmed another human being. How dare you, Bill, say you're not here to say gotcha. Guidelines are there to guide you, not be ignored. With your disciplinary guidelines, we see this board look at the word minimum discipline and then give less. That's unacceptable. You're not here to, to, to give the doctors the benefit of the doubt. You're here to protect the public. You're clearly in the CMA camp, and we have the evidence of you having drinks with CMA honchos before the Senate hearings now. You're clearly not doing your job in the name of patient safety and have been lost to the system that is now protecting doctors. Shame on you. Your public comment. Up next, we have Virginia. Hello. So my concern is you have these guidelines but there's lack of training. Once again, it took 100 doctors to figure out my pelvic pain. Three years. Well, a couple of them had a good part of it. Probably five were knowledgeable on it. Some were very harmful, some were neutral, and five had a piece of the puzzle. So, and that's especially with women's health. So there also needs to be education on proper diagnosis and treatment. When I got in a car accident, it hurt my neck, which felt in my shoulder, I had 15 doctor's appointment. Only this year when I had intractable pain, did I get a proper assessment and I have like five herniated discs in my neck. It took a month to get an injection. I ended up going to the hospital and getting an injection. So I'm pain free now, 
but also Sorry. in the hospital, I was severely over medicated that I don't even remember asking for pain medicine. I don't remember my doctors coming in. I kept on saying, lower the dose, lower the dose, lower the dose. So that was that experience too. And I could protect myself. Also, um, you're missing the part of trauma. 70% of children with chronic pain have a history of trauma, adverse childhood events. And a pain doctor, Davis Bennett in Arizona, asked trauma questions and ACEs, and much of his patients have trauma. They deal with the trauma and the pain goes away. So we need education on the relationship to pain and trauma. And lastly, most of the people with addiction also have trauma. So if doctors assess for trauma and adverse childhood events and navigate them to the proper system to get help, healed, which is lacking in California, they can deal with the trauma and likely not be substance abusers anymore. So also deal with the root part thing, education and trauma. And that's it, I think. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Susan Lauren. Susan, you should be receiving that request when you're in. Hi, um, can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. I, I gave myself a timeout for an hour and I'm back. <laughs> Um, I support patients getting appropriate medication, obviously, and stress increases their pain. And I know what it's like to be on the receiving end of having to struggle for that. Um, I want to say that lawyers also play a part in the opioid problem. I've pointed this out before and I'll point it out again. When I was looking for a medical malpractice lawyer, for the surgical assault, one lawyer told me, actually many mentioned it, but one specifically said, if I didn't go on opioids, she would not take my case. She wanted the jury to see that I was on opioids. I declined and did not sign with that lawyer. Um, so I really think that doctors shouldn't only be, uh, you know, pointed out for this, but there's a lot of crooked lawyers in this game and they need to be looked at. Now I'm in intractable, untenable pain because of what Saul Berger did. And if you do focus on the prevention, as we've been talking about all this time, less surgical harm equals less pain and then less drugs for the people. Uh, I told you before, I was a massage therapist for over 25 years and an excellent one. And I was planning to write a book about everything that I learned, which is a lot. Now, a lot of um, people, by the way, I respect everyone and their different levels of what they're dealing with with pain. I'm not saying this is a catch all and fix all. But again, if we're looking at solutions, as Mr. Um, Brooks said, we're looking to how to solve it. Uh, we really need to bring massage therapy into the conversation of pain and to not do that is irresponsible. Uh, it needs to be covered by insurance. And when I was a massage therapist, I worked in tandem. I worked with doctors. Many of them were chiropractors, but I worked with other doctors as well in all fields. And by the way, I gave massages to surgeons a lot. Um, and so that afforded them the ability to continue doing their job. And we need to give the, the um, you know, massage. So one last thing, I worked in drug rehabs. I had um, personal practice, private practice for 25 years, but but one yeah. of the things that I did along the way was work in drug rehab. And seconds, people right? got off of things, people got off of the medications and said that the massage and the and the workouts and you know all the physical stuff was in the main things that helped them. And so please again focus on prevention and bring massage in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next we have Kristen Ogden. Kristen, you should begin that prompt on your end. Can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Thank you. I'm Kristen Ogden, and I just want to start by thanking the medical board for undertaking this guideline update. I would like to thank Mr. Pacifica and his staff. I would like to thank Mr. I know I'm not supposed to say names, but I'm going to do it anyway, Mr. Brooks, for taking the time to read what I sent out. Um, Dr. Thorpe goes without saying that you know about this subject, you and Dr. Mackey, have done a great service. If this document comes out the way you're making it sound, I have to tell you that I still have a bit of hesitation because there are so many people who will push back at what you want 
to happen as a result of your revision, you will certainly need to, I think, engage with the DEA. The DEA is still telling recently a pain specialist with many years experience in LA that he can't prescribe oral fentanyl off-label for intractable pain, non-cancer, when that particular medicine is the only thing that's ever helped this patient who's been ill for 30 years as a result of being electrocuted. There are things still gonna be happening and it's going to take an effort to push back. I very much look forward to seeing the document and having a chance to comment on it. I will welcome that opportunity and I don't know what the definition of interested parties exactly is, but my group are, they're nobody more interested than we are. These patients in many cases have been suffering for decades. And I will tell you that in terms of being able to contribute relevant information for your consideration, patients and family members who have been living through this nightmare for decades, many went for many years before they finally got good care and then they've had it ripped away. Um, this is greatly needed. And I appreciate the level of effort it appears that you all have put into this. California led the way in the 1990s with the Intractable Pain Treatment Act and the Pain Patients Bill of Rights. I am confident and so hoping that California can lead the way again because nobody else appears to be leading right now. I will tell you very quickly that I disagree with your take on the CDC draft new guideline. Um, they took the numbers out of those 12 sentences, the 12 statements, but the numbers are still in the document and they expanded it to over 200 pages of narrative, still pushing their same agenda. So I can't say that, that taking the numbers out was the main thing. It wasn't really true, um, but I applaud the direction that you seem to be trying to go. Um, thank you very much for what you've done. Thank you for listening to those of us who have been in touch and sent inputs. And I will also take one quick second to thank Sean and the board for continuing the opportunity for virtual participation in these meetings. It's been very helpful. Thank you all very much. Thank you for your public comment. Next up we have Anne Fuquay. Are you able to hear me? We can, Anne, go ahead. Okay, uh, my name is Anne Fuquay. Um, First, I just I want to say I want to say thank you um, for the time that you've taken um, to work on this. Uh, thank you to Dr. Thorpe, uh, Mr. Uh, Brooks, um, uh, the other every, the other board members. Um, you know, I like I, Kristen. You know, she again as always. You know, says everything I want to say, but says it so much better. <laughs> but um, I mean, just the past since 2015, when I had to start traveling to California to get medical care because I could not get that in my home state where I was able to continue medication that allowed me to have a life. You know, so much has changed. It has been such a struggle. At this point now, it's getting three or four day supply because that's what the pharmacy is able to get in stock. And then having to hope and pray they get more in, you know, in a few days. And then that's going to, you know, and having to spend all day on the phone with pharmacies, having to travel across the country at, you know, um, to see a doctor, but, but you know, if this comes out, uh, but, but it's sounding what, like what your, um, what, what's, what Mr. Persifka has described. I mean, I just, I will be so, so grateful because I mean, you know, it has been, it's just every month, every, you know, it seems like it's a, something new somewhere. It's like, well, you know, what's going to happen? What, will I be able to continue this or not? And, you know, I mean, like, um, you know, Kristen said, most of us, you know, we have all tried many, many things. I have had massage, physical therapy, all of that. The um, mindfulness based stress reduction, that to me is very helpful. A lot of things are very helpful, but it's using all of them in combination. And part of that happens to be opioids at high doses. But the result for me has been nothing short of a miracle. I mean, it's just, I have a life. But then I have a life as long as I, you know, with this medication and, you know, I've been on the stable dose for um, over 10 years. I have not needed to increase. And it's just, you know, but it's, it's such a gift, but then it's always feeling that that's going to be taken away. And this is just a huge, you know, ray of hope that I hope I'm not getting too excited ever, you know, but just a ray of hope 
that you know it's something that's going to be helpful to patients like me versus versus hurtful versus something else to, not something else that we need to fight so um again i'm very grateful to all of you and um you know i just i just want to keep the life that i have thank you very much thank you for your bubble coming at this time, President Lawson, I don't see any additional requests. All right, thanks, Sean, and thanks to the public commenters. Bring it back to the board. If there are no further comments, we'll move on to agenda item 10, discussion and possible action on recommendation from the specialty faculty, excuse me, not the specialty, the special faculty permit review committee. Dr. Gananadev. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Lawson. Uh, I thought Marina was going to present, but the Special Faculty Permit Committee met, and uh, there was one candidate. Uh, his name is Brant Fernandez uh, from Brazil. He was put forward by Dr. Alt from USC. He's an ophthalmologist, but with uh, special qualifications in uh, cell transplants in the eye. So the committee approved, and so I'm asking the board to approve Dr. Fran Fernandez for a special faculty permit at USC Keck School of Medicine, Medicine pursuant to BPC Section 2168. Thank you, Dr. Ganana. May I have a motion for approval? So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Uh, sorry, the second, Dr. Helzer. Great. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the members of oh, there's a motion pending? All right, seeing none, are there any comments from the public present in the room? Seeing none again, are there any public comments on WebEx, John? Anyone wishing to make a public comment, please raise your hand or type something in the Q&A box. We'll give you a few mm -hmm. seconds here to queue up. All right, it doesn't seem that there's any public comments on WebEx either, so we'll bring it back to the board for a vote. So, Ms. Uh, Morarity, please call the roll. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Gonadev? Yes. Mr. Brooks? Aye. Dr. Hilzer? Yes. Ms. Jiang? Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Mahomed? Mr. Rayu? Yes. Dr. Thorpe? Yes. Dr. Sai? Yes. Mr. Watkins? Aye. Dr. Yip? Ms. Lawson? Yes. Thank you. The specialty faculty special faculty <laughs> permit for Dr. Brant Fernandez is approved. Uh, with that, our business is concluded for the day with nine minutes to spare on our uh, 6.30 time to end. So we will see everybody uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And until then, the board is in recess. Thank you.